Section 32 of The Frontier in American History by Frederick Jackson Turner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 9. Contributions of the West to American Democracy, Part 3. Magnitude of social achievement is the watchword of the democracy since the Civil War. From petty towns built in the marshes, cities arose whose greatness and industrial power are the wonder of our time. The conditions were ideal for the production of captains of industry. The old democratic admiration for the self-made man, its old deference to the rights of competitive individual development, together with the stupendous natural resources that opened to the conquest of the keenest and the strongest, gave such conditions of mobility as enabled the development of the large corporate industries which in our own decade have marked the West. Thus, in brief, have been outlined the chief phases of the development of Western democracy in the different areas which it has conquered. There has been a steady development of the industrial ideal and a steady increase of the social tendency in this later movement of Western democracy, while the individualism of the frontier, so prominent in the earliest days of the Western advance, has been preserved as an ideal more and more, these individuals, struggling each with the other, dealing with vaster and vaster areas, with larger and larger problems, have found it necessary to combine under the leadership of the strongest. This is the explanation of the rise of those preeminent captains of industry whose genius has concentrated capital to control the fundamental resources of the nation. If now, in the way of recapitulation, we try to pick out from the influences that have gone to the making of Western democracy, the factors which constitute the net result of this movement, we shall have to mention at least the following. Most important of all has been the fact that an area of free land has continually lain on the western border of the settled area of the United States. Whenever social conditions tended to crystallize in the east, whenever capital tended to press upon labor or political restraints to impede the freedom of the mass, there was this gate of escape to the free conditions of the frontier. These free lands promoted individualism, economic equality, freedom to rise, democracy. Men would not accept inferior wages and a permanent position of social subordination when this promised land of freedom and equality was theirs for the taking. Who would rest content under oppressive legislative conditions when with a slight effort he might reach a land wherein to become a co-worker in the building of free cities and free states on the lines of his own ideal? In a word, then, free lands meant free opportunities. Their existence has differentiated the American democracy from the democracies which have preceded it, because ever as democracy in the East took the form of highly specialized and complicated industrial society, in the West it kept in touch with primitive conditions, and by action and reaction these two forces have shaped our history. In the next place, these free lands and this treasury of industrial resources have existed over such vast spaces that they have demanded of democracy increasing spaciousness of design and power of execution. Western democracy is contrasted with the democracy of all other times in the largeness of the tasks to which it has set its hand and in the vast achievements which it has wrought out in the control of nature and of politics. It would be difficult to overemphasize the importance of this training upon democracy. Never before in the history of the world has a democracy existed on so vast an area and handled things in the gross with such success, with such largeness of design, and such grasp upon the means of execution. In short, democracy has learned in the West of the United States how to deal with the problem of magnitude. The old historic democracies were but little states with primitive economic conditions. But the very task of dealing with vast resources over vast areas under the conditions of free competition furnished by the West has produced the rise of those captains of industry whose success in consolidating economic power now raises the question as to whether democracy under such conditions can survive. For the old military type of Western leaders like George Rogers Clark, Andrew Jackson, and William Henry Harrison have been substituted such industrial leaders as James J. Hill, John D. Rockefeller, and Andrew Carnegie. The question is imperative, then. What ideals persist from this democratic experience of the West, and have they acquired sufficient momentum to sustain themselves under conditions so radically unlike those in the days of their origin? 
In other words, the question put at the beginning of this discussion becomes pertinent. Under the forms of the American democracy, is there in reality evolving such a concentration of economic and social power in the hands of a comparatively few men as may make political democracy an appearance rather than a reality? The free lands are gone. The material forces that gave vitality to Western democracy are passing away. It is to the realm of the spirit, to the domain of ideals and legislation, that we must look for Western influence upon democracy in our own days. Western democracy has been, from the time of its birth, idealistic. The very fact of the wilderness appealed to men as a fair, blank page on which to write a new chapter in the story of man's struggle for a higher type of society. The Western wilds, from the Alleghenies to the Pacific, constituted the richest free gift that was ever spread out before civilized man. To the peasant and artisan of the old world, bound by the chains of social class, as old as custom and as inevitable as fate, the West offered an exit into a free life and greater well-being among the bounties of nature, into the midst of resources that demanded manly exertion, and that gave in return the chance for indefinite ascent in the scale of social advance. To each she offered gifts after his will. Never again can such an opportunity come to the sons of men. It was unique, and the thing is so near us, so much a part of our lives, that we do not even yet comprehend its full significance. The existence of this land of opportunity has made America the goal of idealists from the days of the Pilgrim Fathers. With all the materialism of the pioneer movements, this idealistic conception of the vacant lands as an opportunity for a new order of things is unmistakably present. Kipling's Song of the English has given it expression. Quote, we were dreamers dreaming greatly in the man-stifled town. We yearned beyond the skyline where the strange roads go down. Came the whisper, came the vision, came the power with the need, till the soul that is not man's soul was lent us to lead. As the deer breaks, as the steer breaks, from the herd where they graze, in the faith of little children we went on our ways. Then the wood failed, then the food failed, then the last water dried, in the faith of little children we lay down and died. On the sand drift, on the veldt side, in the fern scrub we lay, that our sons might follow after by the bones on the way. Follow after, follow after, we have watered the root, and the bud has come to blossom that ripens for fruit. Follow after, we are waiting by the trails that we lost, for the sound of many footsteps, for the tread of a host. Follow after, follow after, for the harvest is sown, by the bones about the wayside ye shall come to your own. End of quote. That was the vision that called to Roger Williams, that prophetic soul ravished of truth disembodied, unable to enter into treaty with its environment, and forced to seek the wilderness. Oh, how sweet, wrote William Penn from his forest refuge, is the quiet of these parts, freed from the troubles and perplexities of woeful Europe. And here he projected what he called his holy experiment in government. If the later West offers few such striking illustrations of the relation of the wilderness to idealistic schemes, and if some of the designs were fantastic and abortive, nonetheless the influence is a fact. Hardly a Western state but has been the mecca of some sect or band of social reformers, anxious to put into practice their ideals in vacant land, far removed from the checks of a settled form of social organization. Consider the Dunkards, the Icarians, the Fourierists, the Mormons, and similar idealists who sought our Western wilds. But the idealistic influence is not limited to the dreamer's conception of a new state. It gave to the pioneer farmer and city builder a restless energy, a quick capacity for judgment and action, a belief in liberty, freedom of opportunity, and a resistance to the domination of class which infused a vitality and power into the individual atoms of this democratic mass. Even as he dwelt among the stumps of his newly cut clearing, the pioneer had the creative vision of a new order of society. In imagination, he pushed back the forest boundary to the confines of a mighty commonwealth. He willed that log cabins should become the lofty buildings of great cities. He decreed that his children should enter into a heritage of education, comfort, and social welfare, and for this ideal he bore the scars of the wilderness. Possessed with this idea, he ennobled his task and laid deep foundations for a democratic state. 
nor was this idealism by any means limited to the American pioneer. To the old native democratic stock has been added a vast army of recruits from the old world. There are in the Middle West alone four million persons of German parentage out of a total of seven millions in the country. Over a million persons of Scandinavian parentage live in the same region. The democracy of the newer West is deeply affected by the ideals brought by these immigrants from the old world. To them, America was not simply a new home. It was a land of opportunity, of freedom, of democracy. It meant to them, as to the American pioneer that preceded them, the opportunity to destroy the bonds of social caste that bound them in their older home, to hew out for themselves in a new country a destiny proportioned to the powers that God had given them, a chance to place their families under better conditions and to win a larger life than the life that they had left behind. He who believes that even the hordes of recent immigrants from southern Italy are drawn to these shores by nothing more than a dull and blind materialism has not penetrated into the heart of the problem. The idealism and expectation of these children of the old world, the hopes which they have formed for a newer and freer life across the seas, are almost pathetic when one considers how far they are from the possibility of fruition. He who would take stock of American democracy must not forget the accumulation of human purposes and ideals which immigration has added to the American populace. In this connection, it must also be remembered that these democratic ideals have existed at each stage of the advance of the frontier, and have left behind them deep and enduring effects on the thinking of the whole country. Long after the frontier period of a particular region of the United States has passed away, the conception of society, the ideals and aspirations which it produced, persist in the minds of the people. So recent has been the transition of the greater portion of the United States from frontier conditions to conditions of settled life, that we are, over the large portion of the United States, hardly a generation removed from the primitive conditions of the West. If, indeed, we ourselves were not pioneers, our fathers were, and the inherited ways of looking at things, the fundamental assumptions of the American people, have all been shaped by this experience of democracy on its westward march. This experience has been wrought into the very warp and woof of American thought. Even those masters of industry and capital who have risen to power by the conquest of Western resources came from the midst of this society and still profess its principles. John D. Rockefeller was born on a New York farm and began his career as a young businessman in St. Louis. Marcus Hanna was a Cleveland grocer's clerk at the age of 20. Klaus Spreckels, the sugar king, came from Germany as a steerage passenger to the United States in 1848. Marshall Field was a farmer boy in Conway, Massachusetts, until he left to grow up with the young Chicago. Andrew Carnegie came as a 10-year-old boy from Scotland to Pittsburgh, then a distinctively western town. He built up his fortunes through successive grades until he became the dominating factor in the great iron industries and paved the way for that colossal achievement, the Steel Trust. Whatever may be the tendencies of this corporation, there can be little doubt of the democratic ideals of Mr. Carnegie himself. With lavish hand, he has strewn millions through the United States for the promotion of libraries. The effect of this library movement in perpetuating the democracy that comes from an intelligent and self-respecting people can hardly be measured. In his triumphant democracy, published in 1886, Mr. Carnegie, the Iron Master, said, in reference to the mineral wealth of the United States, quote, Thank God these treasures are in the hands of an intelligent people, the democracy, to be used for the general good of the masses, and not made the spoils of monarchs, courts, and aristocracy, to be turned to the base and selfish ends of a privileged hereditary class. End of quote. It would be hard to find a more rigorous assertion of democratic doctrine than the celebrated utterance attributed to the same man that he should feel it a disgrace to die rich. In enumerating the services of American democracy, President Eliot included the corporation as one of its achievements, declaring that, quote, freedom of incorporation, though no longer exclusively a democratic agency, has given a strong support to democratic institutions, end of quote. In one sense, this is doubtless true since the corporation has been one of the means by which small properties can be aggregated into an effective working body. Socialistic writers have long been fond of pointing out also 
that these various concentrations pave the way for and make possible social control. From this point of view, it is possible that the masters of industry may prove to be not so much an incipient aristocracy as the pathfinders for democracy in reducing the industrial world to systematic consolidation suited to democratic control. The great geniuses that have built up the modern industrial concentration were trained in the midst of democratic society. They were the product of these democratic conditions. Freedom to rise was the very condition of their existence. Whether they will be followed by successors who will adopt the exploitation of the masses and who will be capable of retaining under efficient control these vast resources is one of the questions which we shall have to face. This, at least, is clear. American democracy is fundamentally the outcome of the experiences of the American people in dealing with the West. Western democracy, through the whole of its earlier period, tended to the production of a society of which the most distinctive fact was the freedom of the individual to rise under conditions of social mobility, and whose ambition was the liberty and well-being of the masses. This conception has vitalized all American democracy, and has brought it into sharp contrast with the democracies of history, and with those modern efforts of Europe to create an artificial democratic order by legislation. The problem of the United States is not to create democracy, but to conserve democratic institutions and ideals. In the later period of its development, Western democracy has been gaining experience in the problem of social control. It has steadily enlarged the sphere of its action and the instruments for its perpetuation. By its system of public schools, from the grades to the graduate work of the great universities, the West has created a larger single body of intelligent, plain people than can be found elsewhere in the world. Its political tendencies, whether we consider democracy, populism, or republicanism, are distinctly in the direction of greater social control and the conservation of the old democratic ideals. To these ideals the West adheres with even a passionate determination. If, in working out its mastery of the resources of the interior, it has produced a type of industrial leader so powerful as to be the wonder of the world, nevertheless it is still to be determined whether these men constitute a menace to democratic institutions or the most efficient factor for adjusting democratic control to the new conditions. Whatever shall be the outcome of the rush of this huge industrial modern United States to its place among the nations of the earth, the formation of its Western democracy will always remain one of the wonderful chapters in the history of the human race. Into this vast, shaggy continent of ours poured the first feeble tide of European settlement. European men, institutions, and ideas were lodged in the American wilderness, and this great American West took them to her bosom, taught them a new way of looking upon the destiny of the common man, trained them in adaptation to the conditions of the new world, to the creation of new institutions to meet new needs, and ever as society on her eastern border grew to resemble the old world in its social forms and its industry, ever as it began to lose faith in the ideals of democracy, she opened new provinces and dowered new democracies in her most distant domains with her material treasures and with the ennobling influence that the fierce love of freedom, the strength that came from hewing out a home, making a school in a church, and creating a higher future for his family, furnished to the pioneer. She gave to the world such types as the farmer Thomas Jefferson, with his Declaration of Independence, his Statute for Religious Toleration, and his Purchase of Louisiana. She gave us Andrew Jackson, that fierce Tennessee spirit who broke down the traditions of conservative rule, swept away the privacies and privileges of officialdom, and like a Gothic leader, opened the temple of the nation to the populace. She gave us Abraham Lincoln, whose gaunt frontier form and gnarled massive hand told of the conflict with the forest, whose grasp of the axe handle of the pioneer was no firmer than his grasp of the helm of the ship of state as it breasted the seas of civil war. She has furnished to this new democracy her stores of mineral wealth that dwarf those of the old world, and her provinces that in themselves are vaster and more productive than most of the nations of Europe. Out of her bounty has come a nation whose industrial competition alarms the old world, and the masters of whose resources wield wealth and power vaster than the wealth and power of kings. Best of all, the West gave, not only to the American, 
but to the unhappy and oppressed of all lands a vision of hope and assurance that the world held a place where were to be found high faith in man and the will and power to furnish him the opportunity to grow to the full measure of his own capacity great and powerful as are the new sons of her loins the republic is greater than they the paths of the pioneer have widened into broad highways the forest clearing has expanded into affluent commonwealths let us see to it that the ideals of the pioneer in his log cabin shall enlarge into the spiritual life of a democracy where civic power shall dominate and utilize individual achievement for the common good end of section thirty two section thirty three of the frontier in american history by frederick jackson turner this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by colleen mcmahon chapter ten pioneer ideals and the state university part one footnote commencement address at the university of indiana nineteen ten end of footnote the ideals of a people their aspirations and convictions their hopes and ambitions their dreams and determinations are assets in their civilization as real and important as per capita wealth or industrial skill this nation was formed under pioneer ideals during three centuries after captain john smith struck the first blow at the american forest on the eastern edge of the continent the pioneers were abandoning settled society for the wilderness seeking for generation after generation new frontiers their experiences left abiding influences upon the ideas and purposes of the nation indeed the older settled regions themselves were shaped profoundly by the very fact that the whole nation was pioneering and that in the development of the west the east had its own part the first ideal of the pioneer was that of conquest it was his task to fight with nature for the chance to exist not as in older countries did this contest take place in a mythical past told in folklore and epic it has been continuous to our own day facing each generation of pioneers was the unmastered continent vast forests blocked the way mountainous ramparts interposed desolate grass-clad prairies barren oceans of rolling plains arid deserts and a fierce race of savages all had to be met and defeated the rifle and the axe are the symbols of the backwoods pioneer they meant a training in aggressive courage in domination in directness of action in destructiveness to the pioneer the forest was no friendly resource for posterity no object of careful economy he must wage a hand-to-hand -hand war upon it cutting and burning a little space to let in the light upon a dozen acres of hard-won soil and year after year expanding the clearing into new woodlands against the stubborn resistance of primeval trunks and matted roots he made war against the rank fertility of the soil while new worlds of virgin land lay ever just beyond it was idle to expect the pioneer to stay his hand and turn to scientific farming indeed as secretary wilson has said the pioneer would in that case have raised wheat that no one wanted to eat corn to store on the farm and cotton not worth the picking thus fired with the ideal of subduing the wilderness the destroying pioneer fought his way across the continent masterful and wasteful preparing the way by seeking the immediate thing, rejoicing in rude strength and willful achievement. But even this backwoodsman was more than a mere destroyer. He had visions. He was finder as well as fighter, the trailmaker for civilization, the inventor of new ways. Although Rudyard Kipling's Forloper deals with the English pioneer in lands beneath the Southern Cross, yet the poem portrays American traits as well. Quote, the gull shall whistle in his wake the blind wave break in fire he shall fulfil god's utmost will unknowing his desire and he shall see old planets pass and alien stars rise and give the gale his reckless sail in shadow of new skies strong lust of gear shall drive him out and hunger arm his hand to wring food from desert nude his foothold from the sand his neighbour's smoke shall vex his eyes their voices break his rest he shall go forth till south is north sullen and dispossessed he shall desire loneliness and his desire shall bring hard on his heels a thousand wheels a people and a king he shall come back on his own track and by his scarce cold camp there shall he meet the roaring street the derrick and the stamp 
for he must blaze a nation's way with hatchet and with brand, till on his last one wilderness an empire's bulwark stand. End of quote. This quest after the unknown, this yearning beyond the skyline where the strange roads go down, is of the very essence of the backwoods pioneer, even though he was unconscious of its spiritual significance. The pioneer was taught in the school of experience that the crops of one area would not do for a new frontier, that the scythe of the clearing must be replaced by the reaper of the prairies. He was forced to make old tools serve new uses, to shape former habits, institutions, and ideas to changed conditions, and to find new means when the old proved inapplicable. He was building a new society as well as breaking new soil. He had the ideal of nonconformity and of change. He rebelled against the conventional. Besides the ideals of conquest and of discovery, the pioneer had the ideal of personal development, free from social and governmental constraint. He came from a civilization based on individual competition, and he brought the conception with him to the wilderness, where a wealth of resources and innumerable opportunities gave it a new scope. The prizes were for the keenest and the strongest. For them were the best bottomlands, the finest timber tracks, the best salt springs, the richest ore beds, and not only these natural gifts, but also the opportunities afforded in the midst of a forming society. Here were mill sites, town sites, transportation lines, banking centers, openings in the law and politics, all the varied chances for advancement afforded in a rapidly developing society where everything was open to him who knew how to seize the opportunity. The squatter enforced his claim to lands even against the government's title by the use of extra-legal combinations and force. He appealed to lynch law with little hesitation. He was impatient of any governmental restriction upon his individual right to deal with the wilderness. In our own day, we sometimes hear of congressmen sent to jail for violating land laws, but the different spirit in the pioneer days may be illustrated by a speech of Delegate Sibley of Minnesota in Congress in 1852. In view of the fact that he became the state's first governor, a regent of its university, president of its historical society, and a doctor of laws of Princeton, we may assume that he was a pillar of society, and he said, quote, The government has watched its public domain with jealous eye, and there are now enactments upon your statute books aimed at the trespassers upon it, which should be expunged as a disgrace to the country and to the 19th century especially is he pursued with unrelenting severity who has dared to break the silence of the primeval forest by the blows of the American axe. The hardy lumberman who has penetrated to the remotest wilds of the Northwest to drag from their recesses the materials for building up towns and cities in the great valley of the Mississippi has been particularly marked out as a victim. After enduring all the privations and subjecting himself to all the perils incident to his vocation, when he has toiled for months to add by his honest labor to the comfort of his fellow man and to the aggregate wealth of the nation, he finds himself suddenly in the clutches of the law for trespassing on the public domain. The proceeds of his long winter's work are reft from him and exposed to public sale for the benefit of his paternal government, and the object of this oppression and wrong is further harassed by vexatious law proceedings against him. End of quote. Sibley's protest in Congress against these outrages by which the northern lumbermen were harassed in their work of what would now be called stealing government timber aroused no protest from his colleagues. No president called this congressman an undesirable citizen or gave him over to the courts. Thus, many of the pioneers, following the ideal of the right of the individual to rise, subordinated the rights of the nation and posterity to the desire that the country should be developed and that the individual should advance with as little interference as possible. Squatter doctrines and individualism have left deep traces upon American conceptions. But quite as deeply fixed in the pioneer's mind as the ideal of individualism was the ideal of democracy. He had a passionate hatred for aristocracy, monopoly, and special privilege. He believed in simplicity, economy, and in the rule of the people. It is true that he honored the successful man and that he strove in all ways to advance himself. But the West was so free and so vast, the barriers to individual achievement were so remote, that the pioneer was hardly conscious that any danger to equality could come from his competition for natural resources. 
He thought of democracy as in some way the result of our political institutions, and he failed to see that it was primarily the result of the free lands and immense opportunities which surrounded him. Occasional statesmen voiced the idea that American democracy was based on the abundance of unoccupied land, even in the first debates on the public domain. This early recognition of the influence of abundance of land in shaping the economic conditions of American democracy is peculiarly significant today in view of the practical exhaustion of the supply of cheap arable public lands open to the poor man and the coincident development of labor unions to keep up wages. Certain it is that the strength of democratic movements has chiefly lain in the regions of the pioneer. Our governments tend too much to democracy, wrote Izard of South Carolina to Jefferson in 1785. A handicraftsman thinks an apprenticeship necessary to make him acquainted with his business, but our back countrymen are of the opinion that a politician may be born just as well as a poet. The revolutionary ideas, of course, gave a great impetus to democracy, and in substantially every colony there was a double revolution, one for independence and the other for the overthrow of aristocratic control. But in the long run, the effective force behind American democracy was the presence of the practically free land into which men might escape from the oppression or inequalities which burdened them in the older settlements. This possibility compelled the coastwise states to liberalize the franchise, and it prevented the formation of a dominant class, whether based on property or on custom. Among the pioneers, one man was as good as his neighbor. He had the same chance. Conditions were simple and free. Economic equality fostered political equality, an optimistic and buoyant belief in the worth of the plain people, a devout faith in man prevailed in the West. Democracy became almost the religion of the pioneer. He held with passionate devotion the idea that he was building under freedom a new society based on self-government and for the welfare of the average man. And yet, even as he proclaimed the gospel of democracy, the pioneer showed a vague apprehension lest the time be short, lest equality should not endure, lest he might fall behind in the ascending movement of Western society. This led him on in feverish haste to acquire advantages as though he only half believed his dream. Before him lies a boundless continent, wrote de Tocqueville, in the days when pioneer democracy was triumphant under Jackson, and he urges forward as if time pressed and he was afraid of finding no room for his exertions. Even while Jackson lived, labor leaders and speculative thinkers were demanding legislation to place a limit on the amount of land which one person might acquire and to provide free farms. De Tocqueville saw the signs of change. Quote, Between the workman and the master, he said, there are frequent relations, but no real association. I am of the opinion, upon the whole, that the manufacturing aristocracy which is growing up under our eyes is one of the harshest which ever existed in the world. If ever a permanent inequality of conditions and aristocracy again penetrate into the world, it may be predicted that this is the gate by which they will enter. End of quote. But the sanative influences of the free spaces of the West were destined to ameliorate labor's condition, to afford new hopes and new faith to pioneer democracy, and to postpone the problem. As the settlers advanced into provinces whose area dwarfed that of the older sections, Pioneer democracy itself began to undergo changes, both in its composition and in its processes of expansion. At the close of the Civil War, when settlement was spreading with greatest vigor across the Mississippi, the railways began their work as colonists. Their land grants from the government, amounting altogether by 1871 to an area five times that of the state of Pennsylvania, demanded purchasers, and so the railroads pioneered the way for the pioneer. The homestead law increased the tide of settlers. The improved farm machinery made it possible for him to go boldly out onto the prairie and to deal effectively with virgin soil in farms whose cultivated area made the old clearings of the backwoodsmen seem like mere garden plots. Two things resulted from these conditions, which profoundly modified pioneer ideals. In the first place, the new form of colonization demanded an increasing use of capital and the rapidity of the formation of towns, the speed with which society developed made men the more eager to secure bank credit to deal with the new West. This made the pioneer more dependent on the Eastern economic forces. In the second place, the farmer became dependent as never before on transportation companies. 
In this speculative movement, the railroads, finding that they had pressed too far in advance and had issued stock too freely for their earnings to justify the face of the investment, came into collision with the pioneer on the question of rates and of discriminations. The Greenback movement and the Granger movements were appeals to government to prevent what the pioneer thought to be invasions of pioneer democracy. As the Western settler began to face the problems of magnitude in the areas he was occupying, as he began to adjust his life to the modern forces of capital and to complex productive processes, as he began to see that, go where he would, the question of credit and currency, of transportation and distribution in general, conditioned his success, he sought relief by legislation. He began to lose his primitive attitude of individualism. Government began to look less like a necessary evil and more like an instrument for the perpetuation of his democratic ideals. In brief, the defenses of the pioneer Democrat began to shift from free land to legislation, from the ideal of individualism to the ideal of social control through regulation by law. He had no sympathy with a radical reconstruction of society by the revolution of socialism. Even his alliances with the movement of organized labor, which paralleled that of organized capital in the East, were only half-hearted. But he was becoming alarmed over the future of the free democratic ideal. The wisdom of his legislation it is not necessary to discuss here. The essential point is that his conception of the right of government to control social process had undergone a change. He was coming to regard legislation as an instrument of social construction. The individualism of the Kentucky pioneer of 1796 was giving way to the populism of the Kansas pioneer of 1896. The later days of pioneer democracy are too familiar to require much exposition, but they are profoundly significant. As the pioneer doctrine of free competition for the resources of the nation revealed its tendencies, as individual, corporation, and trust, like the pioneer, turned increasingly to legal devices to promote their contrasting ideals, the natural resources were falling into private possession. Tides of alien immigrants were surging into the country to replace the old American stock in the labor market, to lower the standard of living, and to increase the pressure of population upon the land. These recent foreigners have lodged almost exclusively in the dozen great centers of industrial life, and there they have accented the antagonisms between capital and labor by the fact that the labor supply has become increasingly foreign-born and recruited from nationalities who arouse no sympathy on the part of capital and little on the part of the general public. Class distinctions are accented by national prejudices, and democracy is thereby invaded, but even in the dull brains of great masses of these unfortunates from southern and eastern Europe, the idea of America as the land of freedom and of opportunity to rise, the land of pioneer democratic ideals, has found lodgment. And if it is given time, and is not turned into revolutionary lines, it will fructify. As the American pioneer passed on in advance of this new tide of European immigration, he found lands increasingly limited, in place of the old, lavish opportunity for the settler to set his stakes where he would, there were frantic rushes of thousands of eager pioneers across the line of newly opened Indian reservations. Even in 1889, when Oklahoma was open to settlement, 20,000 settlers crowded at the boundaries like straining athletes, waiting the bugle note that should start the race across the line. Today, great crowds gather at the land lotteries of the government as the remaining fragments of the public domain are flung to hungry settlers. Hundreds of thousands of pioneers from the Middle West have crossed the national boundary into Canadian wheat fields eager to find farms for their children, although under an alien flag. And finally, the government has taken to itself great areas of arid land for reclamation by costly irrigation projects whereby to furnish 20-acre tracts in the desert to settlers under careful regulation of water rights. The government supplies the capital for huge irrigation dams and reservoirs, and builds them itself. It owns and operates quarries, coal mines, and timber to facilitate this work. It seeks the remotest regions of the earth for crops suitable for those areas. It analyzes the soils and tells the farmer what and when and how to plant. It is even considered the rental to manufacturers of the surplus water, electrical, and steam power generated in its irrigation works and the utilization of this power to extract nitrates from the air to replenish worn-out soils. 
the pioneer of the arid regions must be both a capitalist and the protege of the government. End of section 33. Section 34 of The Frontier in American History by Frederick Jackson Turner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 10, Pioneer Ideals and the State University, Part 2. Consider the contrast between the conditions of the pioneers at the beginning and at the end of this period of development. Three hundred years ago, adventurous Englishmen on the coast of Virginia began the attack on the wilderness. Three years ago, the President of the United States summoned the governors of 46 states to deliberate upon the danger of the exhaustion of the natural resources of the nation. The pressure of population upon the food supply is already felt, and we are at the beginning only of this transformation. It is profoundly significant that at the very time when American democracy is becoming conscious that its pioneer basis of free land and sparse population is giving way, it is also brought face to face with the startling outcome of its old ideals of individualism and exploitation under competition uncontrolled by government. Pioneer society was not sufficiently sophisticated to work out to its logical result the conception of the self-made man. But the captains of industry, by applying squatter doctrines to the evolution of American industrial society, have made the process so clear that he who runs may read. Contests imply alliances as well as rivalries. The increasing magnitude of the areas to be dealt with and the occurrences of times of industrial stress furnished occasion for such unions. The Panic of 1873 was followed by an unprecedented combination of individual businesses and partnerships into corporations. The Panic of 1893 marked the beginning of an extraordinary development of corporate combinations into pools and trusts, agreements and absorptions, until by the time of the Panic of 1907, it seemed not impossible that the outcome of free competition under individualism was to be monopoly of the most important natural resources and processes by a limited group of men whose vast fortunes were so invested in allied and dependent industries that they constituted the dominating force in the industrial life of the nation. The development of large-scale factory production, the benefit of combination in the competitive struggle, and the tremendous advantage of concentration in securing possession of the unoccupied opportunities were so great that vast accumulations of capital became the normal agency of the industrial world. In almost exact ratio to the diminution of the supply of unpossessed resources, combinations of capital have increased in magnitude and in efficiency of conquest. The solitary backwoodsman wielding his axe at the edge of a measureless forest is replaced by companies capitalized at millions, operating railroads, sawmills, and all the enginery of modern machinery to harvest the remaining trees. A new national development is before us, without the former safety valve of abundant resources open to him who would take. Classes are becoming alarmingly distinct. There is the demand on the one side voiced by Mr. Harriman so well and by others since, that nothing must be done to interfere with the early pioneer ideals of the exploitation and the development of the country's wealth, that restrictive and reforming legislation must on no account threaten prosperity even for a moment. In fact, we sometimes hear in these days from men of influence serious doubts of democracy and intimations that the country would be better off if it freely resigned itself to guidance by the geniuses who are mastering the economic forces of the nation and who, it is alleged, would work out the prosperity of the United States more effectively if unvexed by politicians and people. On the other hand, an inharmonious group of reformers are sounding the warning that American democratic ideals and society are menaced and already invaded by the very conditions that make this apparent prosperity, that the economic resources are no longer limitless and free, that the aggregate national wealth is increasing at the cost of present social justice and moral health, and the future well-being of the American people. The Granger and the Populist were prophets of this reform movement. Mr. Bryan's democracy, Mr. Debs' socialism, and Mr. Roosevelt's republicanism all had in common the emphasis upon the need of governmental regulation of industrial tendencies in the interest of the common man, the checking of the power of those business titans who emerged successful out of the competitive individualism of pioneer America. As land values rise, as meat and bread grow dearer, 
as the process of industrial consolidation goes on, and as eastern industrial conditions spread across the West, the problems of traditional American democracy will become increasingly grave. The time has come when university men may well consider pioneer ideals, for American society has reached the end of the first great period in its formation. It must survey itself, reflect upon its origins, consider what freightage of purposes it carried in its long march across the continent, what ambitions it had for the man, what role it would play in the world. How shall we conserve what was best in pioneer ideals? How adjust the old conceptions to the changed conditions of modern life? Other nations have been rich and prosperous and powerful, but the United States has believed that it had an original contribution to make to the history of society by the production of a self-determining, self-restrained, intelligent democracy. It is in the Middle West that society has formed on lines least like those of Europe. It is here, if anywhere, that American democracy will make its stand against the tendency to adjust to a European type. This consideration gives importance to my final topic, the relation of the university to pioneer ideals and to the changing conditions of American democracy. President Pritchett of the Carnegie Foundation has recently declared that in no other form of popular activity does a nation or state so clearly reveal its ideals or the quality of its civilization as in its system of education, and he finds, especially in the state university, a conception of education from the standpoint of the whole people. If our American democracy were today called to give proof of its constructive ability, he says, the state university and the public school system which it crowns would be the strongest evidence of its fitness which it could offer. It may at least be conceded that an essential characteristic of the state university is its democracy in the largest sense. The provision in the Constitution of Indiana of 1816, so familiar to you all, for a, quote, general system of education ascending in regular gradations from township schools to a state university, wherein tuition shall be gratis and equally open to all, end of quote, expresses the Middle Western conception born in the days of pioneer society and doubtless deeply influenced by Jeffersonian democracy. The most obvious fact about these universities, perhaps, lies in their integral relation with the public schools, whereby the pupil has pressed upon him the question whether he shall go to college, and whereby the road is made open and direct to the highest training. By this means, the state offers to every class the means of education, and even engages in propaganda to induce students to continue. It sinks deep shafts through the social strata to find the gold of real ability in the underlying rock of the masses. It fosters that due degree of individualism which is implied in the right of every human being to have the opportunity to rise in whatever directions his peculiar abilities entitle him to go, subordinate to the welfare of the state. It keeps the avenues of promotion to the highest offices, the highest honors, open to the humblest and most obscure lad who has the natural gifts at the same time that it aids in the improvement of the masses. Nothing in our educational history is more striking than the steady pressure of democracy upon its universities to adapt them to the requirements of all the people. From the state universities of the Middle West, shaped under pioneer ideals, have come the fuller recognition of scientific studies, and especially those of applied science devoted to the conquest of nature. The breaking down of the traditional required curriculum the union of vocational and college work in the same institution, the development of agricultural and engineering colleges and business courses, the training of lawyers, administrators, public men, and journalists, all under the ideal of service to democracy, rather than of individual advancement alone. Other universities do the same thing, but the head springs and the main current of this great stream of tendency come from the land of the pioneers, the democratic states of the Middle West and the people themselves, through their boards of trustees and the legislature, are in the last resort the court of appeal as to the directions and conditions of growth, as well as have the fountain of income from which these universities derive their existence. The state university has thus both a peculiar power in the directness of its influence upon the whole people, and a peculiar limitation in its dependence upon the people. The ideals of the people constitute the atmosphere in which it moves, though it can itself affect this atmosphere. Herein is the source of its strength and the direction of its difficulties. 
for to fulfill its mission of uplifting the state to continuously higher levels the university must in the words of mr bryce serve the time without yielding to it it must recognize new needs without becoming subordinate to the immediately practical to the short-sightedly expedient it must not sacrifice the higher efficiency for the more obvious but lower efficiency it must have the wisdom to make expenditures for results which pay manifold in the enrichment of civilization, but which are not immediate and palpable. In the transitional condition of American democracy, which I have tried to indicate, the mission of the university is most important. The times call for educated leaders. General experience and rule of thumb information are inadequate for the solution of the problems of a democracy which no longer owns the safety fund of an unlimited quantity of untouched resources. Scientific farming must increase the yield of the field. Scientific forestry must economize the woodlands. Scientific experiment and construction by chemist, physicist, biologist, and engineer must be applied to all of nature's forces in our complex modern society. The test tube and the microscope are needed, rather than the axe and rifle in this new ideal of conquest. The very discoveries of science in such fields as public health and the manufacturing processes have made it necessary to depend upon the expert, and if the ranks of experts are to be recruited broadly from the democratic masses as well as from those of larger means, the state universities must furnish at least as liberal opportunities for research and training as the universities based on private endowments furnish. It needs no argument to show that it is not to the advantage of democracy to give over the training of the expert exclusively to privately endowed institutions. But quite as much in the field of legislation and of public life in general, as in the industrial world, is the expert needed. The industrial conditions which shape society are too complex, problems of labor, finance, and social reform too difficult to be dealt with intelligently and wisely without the leadership of highly educated men familiar with the legislation and literature on social questions in other states and nations. By training in science, in law, politics, economics, and history, the universities may supply from the ranks of democracy administrators, legislators, judges, and experts for commissions who shall disinterestedly and intelligently mediate between contending interests. When the words capitalistic classes and the proletariat can be used and understood in America, it is surely time to develop such men, with the ideal of service to the state, who may help to break the force of these collisions, to find common grounds between the contestants, and to possess the respect and confidence of all parties which are genuinely loyal to the best American ideals. The signs of such a development are already plain in the expert commissions of some states, in the increasing proportion of university men in legislatures, in the university men's influence in federal departments and commissions. It is hardly too much to say that the best hope of intelligent and principled progress in economic and social legislation and administration lies in the increasing influence of American universities. By sending out these open-minded experts, by furnishing well-fitted legislators, public leaders and teachers, by graduating successive armies of enlightened citizens accustomed to deal dispassionately with the problems of modern life, able to think for themselves, governed not by ignorance, by prejudice, or by impulse, but by knowledge and reason and high-mindedness, the state universities will safeguard democracy. Without such leaders and followers, democratic reactions may create revolutions, but they will not be able to produce industrial and social progress. America's problem is not violently to introduce democratic ideals, but to preserve and entrench them by courageous adaptation to new conditions. Educated leadership sets bulwarks against both the passionate impulses of the mob and the sinister designs of those who would subordinate public welfare to private greed. Lord Bacon's splendid utterance still rings true, quote, The learning of the few is despotism, the learning of the many is liberty, and intelligent and principled liberty is fame, wisdom, and power. End of quote. There is a danger to the universities in this very opportunity. At first, pioneer democracy had scant respect for the expert. He believed that a fool can put on his coat better than a wise man can do it for him. There is much truth in the belief, and the educated leader, 
even he who has been trained under present university conditions in direct contact with the world about him, will still have to contend with this inherited suspicion of the expert. But if he be well trained and worthy of his training, if he be endowed with creative imagination and personality, he will make good his leadership. A more serious danger will come when the universities are fully recognized as powerful factors in shaping the life of the state, not mere cloisters remote from its life, but an influential element in its life. Then it may easily happen that the smoke of the battlefield of political and social controversy will obscure their pure air, that efforts will be made to stamp out the exceptional doctrine and the exceptional man. Those who investigate and teach within the university walls must respond to the injunction of the church, sursum corda, lift up the heart to high thinking and impartial search for the unsullied truth in the interests of all the people. This is the holy grail of the universities. That they may perform their work, they must be left free, as the pioneer was free, to explore new regions and to report what they find. For like the pioneers, they have the ideal of investigation, they seek new horizons. They are not tied to past knowledge. They recognize the fact that the universe still abounds in mystery, that science and society have not crystallized but are still growing and need their pioneer trailmakers. New and beneficent discoveries in nature, new and beneficial discoveries in the processes and directions of the growth of society, substitutes for the vanishing material basis of pioneer democracy may be expected if the university pioneers are left free to seek the trail. In conclusion, the university has a duty in adjusting pioneer ideals to the new requirements of American democracy, even more important than those which I have named. The early pioneer was an individualist and a seeker after the undiscovered, but he did not understand the richness and complexity of life as a whole. He did not fully realize his opportunities of individualism and discovery. He stood in his somber forest as the traveler sometimes stands in a village on the Alps when the mist has shrouded everything, and only the squalid hut, the stony field, the muddy pathway are in view. But suddenly a wind sweeps the fog away. Vast fields of radiant snow and sparkling ice lie before him. Profound abysses open at his feet and as he lifts his eyes, the unimaginable peak of the Matterhorn cleaves the thin air far, far above. A new and unsuspected world is revealed all about him. Thus, it is the function of the university to reveal to the individual the mystery and the glory of life as a whole, to open all the realms of rational human enjoyment and achievement, to preserve the consciousness of the past, to spread before the eye the beauty of the universe, and to throw wide its portals of duty and of power to the human soul. It must honor the poet and the painter, the writer and the teacher, the scientist and the inventor, the musician and the prophet of righteousness, the men of genius in all fields who make life nobler. It must call forth anew, and for finer uses, the pioneer's love of creative individualism and provide for it a spiritual atmosphere friendly to the development of personality in all uplifting ways. It must check the tendency to act in mediocre social masses with undue emphasis upon the ideals of prosperity and politics. In short, it must summon ability of all kinds to joyous and earnest effort for the welfare and the spiritual enrichment of society. It must awaken new tastes and ambitions among the people. The light of these university watchtowers should flash from state to state until American democracy itself is illuminated with higher and broader ideals of what constitutes service to the state and to mankind, of what are prizes, of what is worthy of praise and reward. So long as success in amassing great wealth for the aggrandizement of the individual is the exclusive or the dominant standard of success, so long as material prosperity, regardless of the conditions of its cost, or the civilization which results, is the shibboleth, American democracy, that faith in the common man which the pioneer cherishes, is in danger. For the strongest will make their way unerringly to whatever goal society sets up as the mark of conceited preeminence. What more effective agency is there for the cultivation of the seed wheat of ideals than the university? Where can we find a more promising body of sowers of the grain? The pioneer's clearing must be broadened into a domain where all that is worthy of human endeavor may find fertile soil on which to grow. 
and America must exact of the constructive business geniuses who owe their rise to the freedom of pioneer democracy, supreme allegiance, and devotion to the commonweal. In fostering such an outcome, and in tempering the asperities of the conflicts that must precede its fulfillment, the nation has no more promising agency than the state universities, no more hopeful product than their graduates. End of section 34. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 35 of The Frontier in American History. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Frontier in American History by Frederick Jackson Turner. Chapter 11. The West and American Ideals. Part 1. True to American traditions that each succeeding generation ought to find in the Republic a better home, once in every year the colleges and universities summon the nation to lift its eyes from the routine of work in order to take stock of the country's purposes and achievements, to examine its past and consider its future. This attitude of self-examination is hardly characteristic of the people as a whole, particularly as it is not characteristic of the historic American. He has been an opportunist rather than a dealer in general ideas. Destiny set him in a current which bore him swiftly along through such a wealth of opportunity that reflection and well-considered planning seemed wasted time. He knew not where he was going, but he was on his way, cheerful, optimistic, busy, and buoyant. Today we are reaching a changed condition, less apparent perhaps in the newer regions than in the old, but sufficiently obvious to extend the commencement frame of mind from the college to the country as a whole. The swift and inevitable current of the upper reaches of the nation's history has borne it to the broader expanse and slower stretches which mark the nearness of the level sea. The vessel, no longer carried along by the rushing waters, finds it necessary to determine its own directions on this new ocean of its future, to give conscious consideration to its motive power and to its steering gear. It matters not so much that those who address these college men and women upon life give conflicting answers to the questions of whence and whither, the pause for remembrance, for reflection and for aspiration is wholesome in itself. Although the American people are becoming more self-conscious, more responsive to the appeal to act by deliberate choices, we should be over-sanguine if we believe that even in this new day these commencement surveys were taken to heart by the general public, or that they were directly and immediately influential upon national thought and action. But even while we check our enthusiasm by this realisation of the common thought, we must take heart. The university's peculiar privilege and distinction lie in the fact that it is not the passive instrument of the state to voice its current ideas. Its problem is not that of expressing tendencies. Its mission is to create tendencies and to direct them. Its problem is that of leadership and of ideals. It is called, of course, to justify the support which the public gives it by working in close and sympathetic touch with those it serves. More than that, it would lose important element of strength if it failed to recognize the fact that improvement and creative movement often come from the masses themselves, instinctively moving toward a better order. The university's graduates must be fitted to take their places naturally and effectually in the common life of the time. But the university is called especially to justify its existence by giving to its sons and daughters something which they could not well have gotten through the ordinary experiences of the life outside its walls. It is called to serve the time by independent research and by original thought. If it were a mere recording instrument of conventional opinion and average information, it is hard to see why the university should exist at all. To clap hands with the common life in order that it may lift that life, to be a radiant centre in kindling the society in which it has its being, these are primary duties of the university. Fortunate the state which gives free play to this spirit of inquiry. Let it grub-stake its intellectual prospectors and send them forth where the trails run out and stop. A famous scientist holds that the universal ether bears vital germs which impinging upon a dead world would bring life to it. So, at least it is, in the world of thought, where energized ideals put in the air and carried here and there by the waves and currents of the intellectual atmosphere fertilize vast inert areas. The university, therefore, has a double duty. On one hand, it must aid in the improvement of the general economic and social environment. It must help on in the work of scientific discovery and of making such conditions of existence, economic, political and social, as will produce more fertile and responsive soil for a higher and better life. It must stimulate a wider demand on the part of the public for right leadership. 
it must extend its operations more widely among the people and sink deeper shafts through social strata to find new supplies of intellectual gold in popular levels yet untouched. And on the other hand, it must find and fit men and women for leadership. It must both awaken new demands and it must satisfy those demands by trained leaders with new motives, with new incentives to ambition, with higher and broader conception of what constitute the prize in life, of what constitutes success. The university has to deal with both the soil and sifted seed in the agriculture of the human spirit. Its efficiency is not the efficiency which the business engineer is fitted to appraise. If it is a training ship, it is a training ship bound on a voyage of discovery seeking new horizons. The economy of the university's consumption can only be rightly measured by the later times which shall possess those new realms of the spirit which its voyage shall reveal. If the ships of Columbus had engaged in a profitable coastwise traffic between Palos and Cadiz, they might have saved sail cloth, but their keels would never have grated on the shores of the new world. The appeal of the undiscovered is strong in America. For three centuries, the fundamental process in its history was the westward movement, the discovery and occupation of the vast free spaces of the continent. We are the first generation of Americans who can look back upon that era as a historic movement now coming to its end. Other generations have been so much a part of it that they could hardly comprehend its significance. To them, it seemed inevitable. The free land and the natural resources seemed practically inexhaustible. Nor were they aware of the fact that their most fundamental traits, their institutions, even their ideals, were shaped by this interaction between the wilderness and themselves. American democracy was born of no theorist's dream. It was not carried into the Susan Constant, to Virginia, nor in the Mayflower to Plymouth. It came out of the American forest, and it gained new strength each time it touched a new frontier. Not the Constitution, but free land and an abundance of natural resources open to a fit people made the democratic type of society in America for three centuries while it occupied its empire. Today we are looking with a shock upon a changed world. The national problem is no longer how to cut and burn away the vast screen of the dense and daunting forest, it is how to save and wisely use the remaining timber. It is no longer how to get the great spaces of fertile prairie land in humid zones out of the hands of the government into the hands of the pioneer. These lands have already passed into private possession. No longer is it a question of how to avoid or cross the great plains in the arid desert. It is a question of how to conquer those rejected lands by new method of farming and by cultivating new crops from seed collected by the government and by scientists from the cold dry steppes of Siberia, the burning sands of Egypt and the remote interior of China. It is a problem of how to bring the precious rills of water on the alkali and sage brush. Population is increasing faster than the food supply. New farmlands no longer increase decade after decade in areas equal to those of European states. While the ratio of increase of improved land declines, the value of farmlands rise and the price of food leaps upward, reversing the old ratio between the two. The cry of scientific farming and the conservation of natural resources replaces the cry of rapid conquest of the wilderness. We have so far won our national home, wrested from it its first rich treasures, and drawn to it the unfortunate of other lands, that we are already obliged to compare ourselves with settled states of the old world. In place of our attitude of contemptuous indifference to the legislation of such countries as Germany and England, even western states like Wisconsin send commissions to study their systems of taxation, workingmen's insurance, old age pensions, and a great variety of other remedies of social ills. If we look about the periphery of the nation, everywhere we see the indications that our world is changing. On the streets of northeastern cities like Boston and New York, the faces which we meet are to a surprising extent those of southeastern Europe. Puritan New England, which turned its capital into factories and mills, and drew to its shores an army of cheap labor, governed these people for a time by a ruling class like an upper stratum between which and the lower strata there was no assimilation. There was no such evolution into an assimilated commonwealth as is seen in Middle Western agricultural states, where immigrant and old native stock came in together and built up a homogeneous society on the principle of give and take. But now the northeastern coast finds its destiny, politically and economically, passing away from the descendants of the Puritans. It is the little Jewish boy, the Greek or the Sicilian, who takes the traveller through historic streets, now the home of these newer people to the old North Church or to Paul Revere's house, or to T. Wharf, and tells you in his strange patois the story of revolution against oppression. 
Along the southern Atlantic and the Gulf Coast, in spite of the preservative influence of the Negro, whose presence has always called out resistance to change on the part of the whites, the forces of social and industrial transformation are at work. The old tidewater aristocracy has surrendered to the upcountry Democrats. Along the line of the Alleghanies, like an advancing column, the forces of northern capital, textile and steel mills, year after year extend their invasion into the lower south. New Orleans, once the mistress of the commerce of the Mississippi Valley, is awakening to new dreams of world commerce. On the southern border, similar invasions of American capital have been entering Mexico. At the same time, the opening of the Panama Canal has completed the dream of the ages of the Straits of Anyan between Atlantic and Pacific. 400 years ago, Balboa raised the flag of Spain at the edge of the Sea of the West, and we are now preparing to celebrate both that anniversary and the piercing of the continent. New relations have been created between Spanish America and the United States, and the world is watching the mediation of Argentina, Brazil, and Chile between the contending forces of Mexico and the Union. Once more, alien national interests lie threatening at our borders, but we no longer appeal to the Monroe Doctrine and send our armies of frontiersmen to settle our concerns offhand. We take counsel with European nations and with the sisterhood of South America and propose a remedy of social reorganization in place of imperious will and force. Whether the effort will succeed or not, it is a significant indication that an old order is passing away when such a solution is undertaken by a president of Scotch Presbyterian stock born in the state of Virginia. End of section 35. Section 36 of The Frontier in American History. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Frontier in American History by Frederick Jackson Turner. Chapter 11, Part 2. If we turn to the northern border, where we are about to celebrate a century of peace with England, we see in progress, like a belated procession of our own history, the spread of pioneers, the opening of new wildernesses, the building of new cities, the growth of a new and mighty nation. That old American advance of the wheat farmer from the Connecticut to the Mohawk and the Genesee, from the Great Valley of Pennsylvania to the Ohio Valley and the prairies of the Middle West, is now by its own momentum and under the stimulus of Canadian homesteads and the high price of wheat, carried across the national border to the once lone plains where the Hudson Bay dog trains crossed the desolate snows of the wild north land. In the Pacific Northwest the era of construction has not ended, but it is so rapidly in progress that we can already see the closing of the age of the pioneer. Already Alaska beckons on the north, and pointing to her wealth of natural resources asks the nation on what new terms the new age will deal with her. Across the Pacific looms Asia, no longer a remote vision and a symbol of the unchanging, but born as by mirage close to our shores and raising grave questions of the common destiny of the people of the ocean. The dreams of Benton and of Seward of a regenerated Orient, when the long march of westward civilization should complete its circle, seem almost to be in process of realization. The age of the Pacific Ocean begins, mysterious and unfathomable in its meaning for our own future. Turning to the interior, we see the same picture of change. When the superintendent of the census in 1890 declared the frontier line no longer traceable, the beginning of the rush into Oklahoma had just occurred. Here, where the broken fragments of Indian nations from the east had been gathered, and where the wilder tribes of the southwest were being settled, came the rush of the land-hungry pioneer. Almost at a blow, the old Indian territory passed away. Populous cities came into being, and it was not long before gushing oil wells made a new era of sudden wealth. The farmlands of the Middle West, taken as free homesteads or bought for a mere pittance, have risen so in value that the original owners have in an increasing degree either sold them in order to reinvest in the newer, cheap lands of the West, or have moved into the town and have left the tillage to tenant farmers. The growth of absentee ownership of the soil is producing a serious problem in the former centres of the Granger and the populist. Along the old northwestern, the Great Lakes are becoming a new Mediterranean sea, joining the realms of wheat and iron ore at one end with the coal and furnaces of the forks of the Ohio, where the most intensive and wide-reaching center of industrial energy exists. City life like that of the East, manufactures and accumulated capital, seem to be reproducing in the center of the Republic the tendencies already so plain on the Atlantic coast. 
across the great plains where buffalo and indian held sway successive industrial waves are passing the old free range gave place to the ranch the ranch to the homestead and now in places in the arid lands the homestead is replaced by the ten or twenty acre irrigated fruit farm the age of cheap land cheap corn and wheat and cheap cattle has gone forever the federal government has undertaken vast paternal enterprises of reclamation of the desert in the rocky mountains where at the time of civil war the first important rushes to gold and silver mines carried the frontier backward on a march toward the east the most amazing transformations have occurred here where prospectors made new trails and lived the wild free life of mountain men here where the human spirit seemed likely to attain the largest measure of individual freedom and where fortune beckoned to the common man have come revolutions wrought by the demand for organized industry and capital in the regions where the popular tribunal and the free competitive life flourished we have seen law and order break down in the unmitigated collision of great aggregations of capital with each other and with organized socialistic labor the cripple creek strikes the contests at butte the goldfield mobs the recent colorado fighting all tell a similar story the solid impact of contending forces in regions where civic power and loyalty to the state have never fully developed like the Grand Canyon, where in dazzling light the huge geologic history is written so large that none may fail to read it, so in the Rocky Mountains the dangers of modern American industrial tendencies have been exposed. As we crossed the Cascades on our way to Seattle, one of the passengers was moved to explain his feeling on the excellence of Puget Sound in contrast with the remaining visible universe. He did it well in spite of irreverent interruptions from those fellow travellers who were unconverted children of the East, and at last he broke forth in passionate challenge, Why should I not love Seattle? It took me from the slums of the Atlantic coast, a poor Swedish boy with hardly fifteen dollars in my pocket. It gave me a home by the beautiful sea, it spread before my eyes a vision of snow-capped peaks and smiling fields, it brought abundance and a new life to me and my children, and I love it, I love it. If I were a multi-millionaire, I would charter freight cars and carry away from the crowded tenements and noisome alleys of the eastern cities and the old world the toiling masses and let them loose in our vast forests and ore-laden mountains to learn what life really is. And my heart was stirred by his words and by the whirling spaces of woods and peaks through which we passed. But as I looked and listened to his passionate outcry, I remembered the words of Talleyrand, the exiled Bishop of Orton, in Washington's administration. Looking down from an eminence not far from Philadelphia upon a wilderness which is now in the heart of that huge industrial society where population presses on the means of life, even the cold-blooded and cynical Talleyrand, gazing upon those unpeopled hills and forests, kindled with the vision of coming clearings, the smiling farms and grazing herds that were to be, the populous towns that should be built, the newer and finer social organization that should be there arise. And then I remembered the hall in Harvard's Museum of Social Ethics, through which I pass to my lecture room when I speak on the history of the westward movement. That hall is covered with an exhibit of the work in Pittsburgh steel mills and of the congested tenements. Its charts and diagrams tell of the long hours of work, the death rate, the relation of typhoid to the slums, the gathering of the poor of all southeastern Europe to make a civilization at that center of American industrial industry and vast capital that is a social tragedy. As I enter my lecture room through that hall, I speak of the young Washington leading his Virginia frontiersmen to the magnificent forest at the forks of the Ohio, where Braddock and his men, carving a cross on the wilderness rim, were struck by the painted savages in the primeval woods. Huge furnaces belch forth perpetual fires and Huns and Bulgars. Poles and Sicilians struggle for a chance to earn their daily bread and live a brutal and degraded life irresistibly there rushed across my mind the memorable words of huxley even the best of modern civilization appears to me to exhibit a condition of mankind which neither embodies any worthy ideal nor even possesses the merit of stability i do not hesitate to express the opinion that if there is no hope of a large improvement of the condition of the greater part of the human family if it is true that the increase of knowledge, the winning of a greater dominion over nature, which is its consequence, and the wealth which follows upon that dominion are to make no difference in the extent and the intensity of the want, with its concomital physical and moral degradation, among the masses of the people, I should hail the advent of some kindly comet which would sweep the whole affair away as a desirable consummation. 
But if there is disillusion and shock and apprehension as we come to realize these changes, to strong men and women there is challenge and inspiration in them too. In place of old frontiers of wilderness, there are new frontiers of unwon fields of science, fruitful for the needs of the race. There are frontiers of better social domains yet unexplored. Let us hold to our attitude of faith and courage and creative zeal. Let us dream as our fathers dreamt, and let us make our dreams come true. Daughters of time, the hypocritic days, muffled and dumb like barefoot dervishes, and marching single in an endless life, bear diadems and faggots in their hands. To each they offer gifts after his will, bread, kingdoms, stars, and sky that hold them all. I, in my pleached garden, watch the pomp, forgot my morning wishes, hastily took a few herbs and apples, and the day turned and departed silent. I, too late, under her solemn fillet, saw the scorn. What were America's morning wishes? From the beginning of that long westward march of the American people, America has never been the home of mere contented materialism. It has continuously sought new ways and dreamed of a perfected social type. In the 15th century, when men dealt with the new world which Columbus found, the ideal of discovery was dominant. Here was placed within the reach of men whose ideas had been bounded by the Atlantic, new realms to be explored. America became the land of European dreams, its fortunate islands were made real, where, in the imagination of old Europe, peace and happiness as well as riches and eternal youth were to be found. To Sir Edwin Sandys and his friends of the London Company, Virginia offered an opportunity to erect the republic for which they had longed in vain in England. To the Puritans, New England was the new land of freedom, wherein they might establish the institutions of God according to their own faith. As the vision died away in Virginia toward the close of the 17th century, it was taken up anew by the fiery Bacon with his revolution to establish a real democracy in place of the rule of the planter aristocracy that formed along the coast. Hardly had he been overthrown when in the 18th century the democratic ideal was rejuvenated by the strong frontiersmen who pressed beyond the New England coast into the Berkshires and up into the valleys of the Green Mountains of Vermont and by the Scotch-Irish and German pioneers who followed the Great Valley from Pennsylvania into the upland south. In both the Yankee frontiersmen and the Scotch-Irish Presbyterians of the South, the Calvinistic conception of the importance of the individual, bound by free covenant to his fellow men and to God, was a compelling influence, and all their wilderness experience combined to emphasize the ideals of opening new ways, of giving freer play to the individual, and of constructing democratic society. When the backwoodsmen crossed the Alleghenies, they put between themselves and the Atlantic coast a barrier which seemed to separate them from a region already too much like the Europe they had left, and as they followed the courses of the rivers that flowed to the Mississippi, they called themselves men of the western waters, and their new home in the Mississippi Valley was the western world. Here, by the thirties, Jacksonian democracy flourished, strong in the faith of the intrinsic excellence of the common man, in his right to make his own place in the world, and in his capacity to share in government. But while Jacksonian democracy demanded these rights, it was also loyal to leadership, as the very name implies. It was ready to follow to the uttermost the man in whom it placed its trust, whether the hero were frontier fighter or president, and it even rebuked and limited its own legislative representatives and recalled its senators when they ran counter to their chosen executive. Jacksonian democracy was essentially rural. It was based on the good fellowship and genuine social feeling of the frontier, in which classes and inequalities of fortune played little part. But it did not demand equality of condition, for there was abundance of natural resources and the belief that the self-made man had a right to his success in the free competition which Western life afforded was as prominent in their thought as was the love of democracy. On the other hand, they viewed governmental restraints with suspicion as a limitation on their right to work out their own individuality. For the banking institutions and capitalists of the East, they had an instinctive antipathy. Already they feared that the money power, as Jackson called it, was planning to make hewers of wood and drawers of water of the common people. In this view, they found allies among the labor leaders of the East, who in the same period began their fight for better conditions of the wage earner. Those locofocos were the first Americans to demand fundamental social change for the benefit of the workers in the cities. Like the Western pioneers, they protested against monopolies and special privilege. But they also had a constructive policy, whereby society was to be kept democratic by free gifts of the public land, so that surplus labor might not bid against itself, but might find an outlet in the West. 
Thus, to both the labor theorist and the practical pioneer, the existence of what seemed inexhaustible cheap land and unpossessed resources was the condition of democracy. In those years of the 30s and 40s, Western democracy took on its own distinctive form. Travelers like de Tocqueville and Harriet Martineau came to study and to report it enthusiastically to Europe. End of section 36. Section 37 of The Frontier in American History. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Frontier in American History by Frederick Jackson Turner. Chapter 11, Part 3. Side by side with this westward marching army of individualistic, liberty loving, democratic backwoodsmen went a more northern stream of pioneers who cherished similar ideas but added to them the desire to create new industrial centres, to build up factories, to build railroads, and to develop the country by founding cities and extending prosperity. They were ready to call upon legislatures to aid in this, by subscriptions to stock, grants of franchises, promotion of banking, and internal improvements. These were the Whig followers of that other Western leader, Henry Clay, and their early strength lay in the Ohio Valley, and particularly among the well-to-do. In the South, their strength was found among the aristocracy of the Cotton Kingdom. Both of these Western groups, Whigs and Democrats alike, had one common ideal, the desire to leave their children a better heritage than they themselves had received, and both were fired with devotion to the ideal of creating in this new world a home more worthy of mankind. Both were ready to break with the past, to boldly strike out new lines of social endeavour, and both believed in American expansion. Before these tendencies had worked themselves out, three new forces entered. In the sudden extension of our boundaries to the Pacific coast, which took place in the 40s, the nation won so vast a domain that its resources seemed illimitable, and its society seemed able to throw off all its maladies by the very presence of these vast new spaces. At the same period, the great activity of railroad building to the Mississippi Valley occurred, making these lands available and diverting attention to the task of economic construction. The third influence was the slavery question, which, becoming acute, shaped the American ideals and public discussion for nearly a generation. Viewed from one angle, this struggle involved the great question of national unity. From another, it involved the question of the relations of labor and capital, democracy and aristocracy. It was not without significance that Abraham Lincoln became the very type of American pioneer democracy, the first adequate and elemental demonstration to the world that democracy could produce a man who belonged to the ages. After the war, new national energies were set loose, and new construction and development engaged the attention of the Westerners as they occupied prairies and great plains and mountains. Democracy and capitalistic development did not seem antagonistic. With the passing of the frontier, Western social and political ideals took new form. Capital began to consolidate in even greater masses and increasingly attempted to reduce to system and control the processes of industrial development. Labor with equal step organized its forces to destroy the old competitive system. It is not strange that the Western pioneers took alarm for their ideals of democracy as the outcome of the free struggle for the national resources became apparent. They espoused the cause of governmental activity. It was a new gospel, for the Western radical became convinced that he must sacrifice his ideal of individualism and free competition in order to maintain his ideal of democracy. Under this conviction, the populist revised the pioneer conception of government. He saw in government no longer something outside of him, but the people themselves shaping their own affairs. He demanded, therefore, an extension of the powers of governments in the interest of his historic ideal of democratic society. He demanded not only free silver, but the ownership of the agencies of communication and transportation, the income tax, the postal savings bank, the provision of means of credit for agriculture, the construction of more effective devices to express the will of the people, primary nominations, direct elections, initiative, referendum, and recall. In a word, capital, labor, and the Western pioneer all deserted the ideal of competitive individualism in order to organize their interests in more effective combinations. The disappearance of the frontier, the closing of the era which was marked by the influence of the West as a form of society, brings with it new problems of social adjustment, new demands for considering our past ideals and our present needs. Let us recall the conditions of the foreign relations along our borders, the dangers that wait us if we fail to unite in the solution of our domestic problems. 
Let us recall those internal evidences of the destruction of our old social order. If we take to heart this warning, we shall do well also to recount our historic ideals, to take stock of those purposes and the fundamental assumptions that have gone to make the American spirit and the meaning of America in world history. First of all, there was the ideal of discovery, the courageous determination to break new paths, indifference to the dogma that because an institution or a condition exists, it must remain. All American experience has gone to the making of the spirit of innovation. It is in the blood and will not be repressed. Then there was the ideal of democracy, the ideal of a free, self-directing people, responsive to leadership in the forming of programs and their execution, but insistent that the procedure should be that of free choice, not of compulsion. But there was also the ideal of individualism. This democratic society was not a disciplined army, where all must keep step and where the collective interests destroyed individual will and work. Rather, it was a mobile mass of freely circulating atoms, each seeking its own place and finding play for its own powers and for its own original initiative. We cannot lay too much stress upon this point, for it was at the very heart of the whole American movement. The world was to be made a better world by the example of a democracy in which there was freedom of the individual, in which there was the vitality and mobility productive of originality and variety. Bearing in mind the far-reaching influence of the disappearance of unlimited resources open to all men for the taking, and considering the recoil of the common man when he saw the outcome of the competitive struggle for those resources as the supply came to its end over most of the nation, we can understand the reaction against individualism and in favour of drastic assertion of the powers of government. Legislation is taking the place of the free lands as the means of preserving the ideal of democracy, but at the same time it is endangering the other pioneer ideal of creative and competitive individualism. Both were essential and constituted what was best in America's contribution to history and to progress. Both must be preserved if the nation would be true to its past and would fulfil its highest destiny. It would be a grave misfortune if these people, so rich in experience, in self-confidence and aspiration, in creative genius, should turn to some old-world discipline of socialism or plutocracy or despotic rule, whether by class or by dictator. Nor shall we be driven to these alternatives. Our ancient hopes, our courageous faith, our underlying good humour and love of fair play will triumph in the end. There will be give and take in all directions. There will be disinterested leadership under loyalty to the best American ideals. Nowhere is this leadership more likely to arise than among the men trained in the universities, aware of the promise of the past and the possibilities of the future. The times call for new ambitions and new motives. In a most suggestive essay on the problems of modern democracy, Mr. Godkin has said, M. de Tocqueville and all his followers take it for granted that the great incentive to excellence in all countries in which excellence is found is the patronage and encouragement of an aristocracy. The democracy is generally content with mediocrity. But where is the proof of this? The incentive to exertion which is widest, most constant and most powerful in its operations in all civilized countries is the desire of distinction. And this may be composed either of love of fame, or love of wealth, or of both. In literary and artistic and scientific pursuits, sometimes the strongest influence is exerted by a love of the subject. But it may safely be said that no man has ever laboured in any of the higher colleges to whom the applause and appreciation of his fellows was not one of the sweetest rewards of his exertions. What is there, we would ask, in the nature of democratic institutions that should render this great spring of action powerless, that should deprive glory of all radiance and put ambition to sleep? Is it not notorious, on the contrary, that one of the most marked peculiarities of democratic society, or of a society drifting toward democracy, is the fire of competition which rages in it, the fevered anxiety which possesses all its members to rise above the dead level to which the law is ever seeking to confine them, and by some brilliant stroke become something higher and more remarkable than their fellows. The secret of that great restlessness, which is one of the most disagreeable accompaniments of life in democratic countries, is in fact due to the eagerness of everybody to grasp the prizes of which, in aristocratic countries, only the few have much chance. And in no other society is success more worshipped, its distinction of any kind more widely flattered and caressed. 
In democratic societies, in fact, excellence is the first title to distinction. In aristocratic ones, there are two or three others which are far stronger and which must be stronger or aristocracy could not exist. The moment you acknowledge that the highest social position ought to be the reward of the man who has the most talent, you make aristocratic institutions impossible. All that was buoyant and creative in American life would be lost if we gave up the respect for distinct personality and variety in genius and came to the dead level of common standards. To be socialized into an average and placed under the tutelage of the mass of us, as a recent writer has put it, would be an irreparable loss. Nor is it necessary in a democracy, as these words of God can well disclose. What is needed is the multiplication of motives for ambition and the opening of new lines of achievement for the strongest. As we turn from the task of the first rough conquest of the continent, there lies before us a whole wealth of unexploited resources in the realm of the spirit. Arts and letters, science and better social creation, loyalty and political service to the common well. These and a thousand other directions of activity are open to the men who formerly under the incentive of attaining distinction by amassing extraordinary wealth saw success only in material display. Newer and finer careers will open to the ambitious when once public opinion shall award the laurels to those who rise above their fellows in these new fields of labour. It has not been the gold but the getting of the gold that has caught the imaginations of our captains of industry. Their real enjoyment lay not in the luxuries which wealth brought, but in the work of construction and in the place which society awarded them. A new era will come if schools and universities can only widen the intellectual horizon of the people, help to lay the foundations of a better industrial life, show them new goals for endeavour, inspire them with more varied and higher ideals. The Western spirit must be invoked for new and nobler achievements. Of that matured Western spirit, Tennyson's Ulysses is a symbol. I am become a name, for always roaming with an hungry heart, much have I seen and known. I am a part of all that I have met, yet all experience is an arch, where through gleams at that untravelled world, whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. How dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine in use. And this grey spirit yearning in desire to follow knowledge like a shining star beyond the utmost hound of human thought. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. Push off, and sitting well in order, smite the sounding furrows, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. End of section 37. Section 38 of The Frontier in American History by Frederick Jackson Turner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 12. Social Forces in American History, Part 1. Footnote. Annual Address as the President of the American Historical Association, delivered at Indianapolis, December 28, 1910. End of footnote. The transformations through which the United States is passing in our own day are so profound, so far-reaching, that it is hardly an exaggeration to say that we are witnessing the birth of a new nation in America. The revolution in the social and economic structure of this country during the past two decades is comparable to what occurred when independence was declared and the Constitution was formed, or to the changes wrought by the era which began half a century ago, the era of civil war and reconstruction. These changes have been long in preparation and are in part the result of worldwide forces of reorganization incident to the age of steam production and large-scale industry, and in part the result of the closing of the period of the colonization of the West. They have been prophesied and the course of the movement partly described by students of American development, but after all it is with a shock that the people of the United States are coming to realize that the fundamental forces which have shaped their society up to the present are disappearing. Twenty years ago, as I have before had occasion to point out, the superintendent of the census declared that the frontier line, which its maps had depicted for decade after decade of the westward march of the nation, could no longer be described. Today, we must add that the age of free competition of individuals for the unpossessed resources of the nation is nearing its end. 
It is taking less than a generation to write the chapter which began with the disappearance of the line of the frontier, the last chapter in the history of the colonization of the United States, the conclusion to the annals of its pioneer democracy. It is a wonderful chapter, this final rush of American energy upon the remaining wilderness. Even the bare statistics become eloquent of a new era. They no longer derive their significance from the exhibit of vast proportions of the public domain transferred to agriculture, of wildernesses equal to European nations changed decade after decade into the farm area of the United States. It is true there was added to the farms of the nation between 1870 and 1880 a territory equal to that of France, and between 1880 and 1900, a territory equal to the European area of France, Germany, England, and Wales combined. The records of 1910 are not yet available, but whatever they reveal, they will not be so full of meaning as the figures which tell of upleaping wealth and organization and concentration of industrial power in the East in the last decade. As the final provinces of the Western Empire have been subdued to the purposes of civilization and have yielded their spoils, as the spheres of operation of the great industrial corporations have extended with the extension of American settlement, production and wealth have increased beyond all precedent. The total deposits in all national banks have more than trebled in the present decade. The money in circulation has doubled since 1890. The flood of gold makes it difficult to gauge the full meaning of the incredible increase in values, for in the decade ending with 1909, over 41,600,000 ounces of gold were mined in the United States alone. Over 4 million ounces have been produced every year since 1905, whereas between 1880 and 1894, no year showed a production of 2 million ounces. As a result of this swelling stream of gold and instruments of credit, aided by a variety of other causes, prices have risen until their height has become one of the most marked features and influential factors in American life producing social readjustments and contributing effectively to party revolutions. But if we avoid those statistics which require analysis because of the changing standard of value, we still find that the decade occupies an exceptional place in American history. More coal was mined in the United States in the 10 years after 1897 than in all the life of the nation before that time. 50 years ago, we mined less than 15 million long tons of coal. In 1907, we mined nearly 429 million. At the present rate, it is estimated that the supply of coal would be exhausted at a date no farther in the future than the formation of the Constitution is in the past. Iron and coal are the measures of industrial power. The nation has produced three times as much iron ore in the past two decades as in all its previous history. The production of the past 10 years was more than double that of the prior decade. Pig iron production is admitted to be an excellent barometer of manufacture and of transportation. Never until 1898 had this reached an annual total of 10 million long tons, but in the five years beginning with 1904, it averaged over twice that. By 1907, the United States had surpassed Great Britain, Germany, and France combined in the production of pig iron and steel together. And in the same decade, a single great corporation has established its domination over the iron mines and steel manufacture of the United States. It is more than a mere accident that the United States Steel Corporation, with its stocks and bonds aggregating $1,400,000,000, was organized at the beginning of the present decade. The former wilderness about Lake Superior has, principally in the past two decades, established its position as overwhelmingly the preponderant source of iron ore, present and prospective, in the United States, a treasury from which Pittsburgh has drawn wealth and extended its unparalleled industrial empire in these years. The tremendous energies thus liberated at this center of industrial power in the United States revolutionized methods of manufacture in general and in many indirect ways profoundly influenced the life of the nation. Railroad statistics also exhibit unprecedented development, the formation of a new industrial society. The number of passengers carried one mile more than doubled between 1890 and 1908. Freight carried one mile has nearly trebled in the same period and has doubled in the past decade. Agricultural products tell a different story. The corn crop has only risen from about 2 billion bushels in 1891 to 2 and 7 tenths billions in 1909 
Wheat from 611 million bushels in 1891 to only 737 million in 1909, and cotton from about 9 million bales in 1891 to 10 and 3 tenths million bales in 1909. Population has increased in the United States proper from about 62 and one half millions in 1890 to 75 and one half millions in 1900 to over 90 millions in 1910. It is clear from these statistics that the ratio of the nation's increased production of immediate wealth by the enormously increased exploitation of its remaining natural resources vastly exceeds the ratio of increase of population, and still more strikingly exceeds the ratio of increase of agricultural products. Already population is pressing upon the food supply, while capital consolidates in billion-dollar organizations. The triumphant democracy whose achievements the Iron Master celebrated has reached a stature even more imposing than he could have foreseen, but still less did he perceive the changes in democracy itself and the conditions of its life which have accompanied this material growth. Having colonized the Far West, having mastered its internal resources, the nation turned at the conclusion of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century to deal with the Far East, to engage in the world politics of the Pacific Ocean. Having continued its historic expansion into the lands of the old Spanish Empire by the successful outcome of the recent war, the United States became the mistress of the Philippines at the same time that it came into possession of the Hawaiian Islands and the controlling influence in the Gulf of Mexico. It provided early in the present decade for connecting its Atlantic and Pacific coasts by the Isthmian Canal and became an imperial republic with dependencies and protectorates, admittedly a new world power, with a potential voice in the problems of Europe, Asia, and Africa. This extension of power, this undertaking of grave responsibilities in new fields, this entry into the sisterhood of world states, was no isolated event. It was, indeed, in some respects, the logical outcome of the nation's march to the Pacific, the sequence to the era in which it was engaged in occupying the free lands and exploiting the resources of the West. When it had achieved this position among the nations of the earth, the United States found itself confronted also with the need of constitutional readjustment arising from the relations of federal government and territorial acquisitions. It was obliged to reconsider questions of the rights of man and traditional American ideals of liberty and democracy in view of the task of government of other races politically inexperienced and undeveloped. If we turn to consider the effect upon American society and domestic policy in these two decades of transition, we are met with palpable evidences of the invasion of the old pioneer democratic order. Obvious among them is the effect of unprecedented immigration to supply the mobile army of cheap labor for the centers of industrial life. In the past 10 years, beginning with 1900, over 8 million immigrants have arrived. The newcomers of the eight years since 1900 would, according to a writer in 1908, quote, repopulate all the five older New England states as they stand today, or if properly disseminated over the newer parts of the country, they would serve to populate no less than 19 states of the Union as they stand, end of quote. In 1907, quote, there were one and one quarter million arrivals. This number would entirely populate both New Hampshire and Maine, two of our oldest states, the arrivals of this one year would found a state with more inhabitants than any one of the 21 of our other existing commonwealths which could be named. End of quote. Not only has the addition to the population from Europe been thus extraordinary, it has come in increasing measure from southern and eastern Europe. For the year 1907, Professor Ripley, whom I am quoting, has redistributed the incomers on the basis of physical type and finds that one quarter of them were of the Mediterranean race, one quarter of the Slavic race, one eighth Jewish, and only one sixth of the Alpine and one sixth of the Teutonic. In 1882, Germans had come to the amount of 250,000. In 1907, they were replaced by 330,000 South Italians. Thus, it is evident that the ethnic elements of the United States have undergone startling changes. And instead of spreading over the nation, these immigrants have concentrated especially in the cities and great industrial centers in the past decade. The composition of the labor class and its relation to wages and to the Native American employer have been deeply influenced thereby. 
the sympathy of the employers with labor has been unfavorably affected by the pressure of great numbers of immigrants of alien nationality and of lower standards of life. The familiar facts of the massing of population in the cities and the contemporaneous increase of urban power, and of the massing of capital and production in fewer and vastly greater industrial units, especially attest the revolution. Quote, it is a proposition too plain to require elucidation, wrote Richard Rush, Secretary of the Treasury, in his report of 1827, that the creation of capital is retarded rather than accelerated by the diffusion of a thin population over a great surface of soil. End of quote. Thirty years before Rush wrote these words, Albert Gallatin declared in Congress that, quote, if the cause of the happiness of this country were examined into, it would be found to arise as much from the great plenty of land in proportion to the inhabitants which their citizens enjoyed as from the wisdom of their political institutions, end of quote. Possibly both of these Pennsylvania financiers were right under the conditions of the time, but it is at least significant that the capital and labor entered upon a new era as the end of the free lands approached. A contemporary of Gallatin in Congress had replied to the argument that cheap lands would depopulate the Atlantic coast by saying that if a law were framed to prevent ready access to western lands, it would be tantamount to saying that there is some class which must remain, quote, and by law be obliged to serve the others for such wages as they please to give, end of quote. The passage of the arable public domain into private possession has raised this question in a new form and has brought forth new answers. This is peculiarly the era when competitive individualism in the midst of vast unappropriated opportunities changed into the monopoly of the fundamental industrial processes by huge aggregations of capital as the free lands disappeared. All the tendencies of the large-scale production of the 20th century, all the trend to the massing of capital in large combinations, all of the energies of the age of steam found in America exceptional freedom of action, and were offered regions of activity equal to the states of all Western Europe. Here they reached their highest development. The decade following 1897 is marked by the work of Mr. Harriman and his rivals in building up the various railroads into a few great groups, a process that had gone so far that before his death, Mr. Harriman was ambitious to concentrate them all under his single control. High finance under the leadership of Mr. Morgan steadily achieved the consolidation of the greater industries into trusts or combinations and affected a community of interests between them and a few dominant banking organizations with allied insurance companies and trust companies. In New York City have been centered, as never before, the banking reserves of the nation, and here, by the financial management of capital and speculative promotion, there has grown up a unified control over the nation's industrial life. Colossal private fortunes have arisen. No longer is the per capita wealth of the nation a real index to the prosperity of the average man. Labor, on the other hand, has shown an increasing self-consciousness, is combining and increasing its demands. In a word, the old pioneer individualism is disappearing, while the forces of social combination are manifesting themselves as never before. The self-made man has become, in popular speech, the coal baron, the steel king, the oil king, the cattle king, the railroad magnate, the master of high finance, the monarch of trusts. The world has never before seen such huge fortunes exercising combined control over the economic life of a people, and such luxury as has come out of the individualistic pioneer democracy of America in the course of competitive evolution. At the same time, the masters of industry who control interests which represent billions of dollars do not admit that they have broken with pioneer ideals. They regard themselves as pioneers under changed conditions, carrying on the old work of developing the natural resources of the nation, compelled by the constructive fever in their veins, even in ill health and old age and after the accumulation of wealth beyond their power to enjoy, to seek new avenues of action and of power to chop new clearings, to find new trails, to expand the horizon of the nation's activity, and to extend the scope of their dominion. Quote, this country, said the late Mr. Harriman in an interview a few years ago, has been developed by a wonderful people flush with enthusiasm, imagination, and speculative bent. They have been magnificent pioneers. They saw into the future and adapted their work to the possibilities. Stifle that enthusiasm, 
deaden that imagination, and prohibit that speculation by restrictive and cramping conservative law, and you tend to produce a more abundant and conservative people and country. End of quote. This is an appeal to the historic ideals of Americans who viewed the Republic as the guardian of individual freedom to compete for the control of the natural resources of the nation. On the other hand, we have the voice of the insurgent West, recently given utterance in the new nationalism of ex-President Roosevelt, demanding increase of federal authority to curb the special interests, the powerful industrial organizations, and the monopolies for the sake of the conservation of our natural resources and the preservation of American democracy. End of section 38. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 39 of The Frontier in American History by Frederick Jackson Turner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 12, Social Forces in American History, Part 2. The past decade has witnessed an extraordinary federal activity in limiting individual and corporate freedom for the benefit of society. To that decade belong the Conservation Congresses, and the effective organization of the Frontier Service and the Reclamation Service. Taken together, these developments alone would mark a new era, for over 300 million acres are, as a result of this policy, reserved from entry and sale, an area more than equal to that of all the states which established the Constitution, if we exclude their western claims, and these reserved lands are held for a more beneficial use of their forests, minerals, arid tracts, and water rights by the nation as a whole. Another example is the extension of the activity of the Department of Agriculture, which seeks the remotest regions of the earth for crops suitable to the areas reclaimed by the government, maps and analyzes the soils, fosters the improvement of seeds and animals, tells the farmer when and how and what to plant, and makes war upon diseases of plants and animals and insect pests. The recent legislation for pure food and meat inspection and the whole mass of regulative law under the Interstate Commerce Clause of the Constitution further illustrates the same tendency. Two ideals were fundamental in traditional American thought, ideals that developed in the pioneer era. One was that of individual freedom to compete unrestrictedly for the resources of a continent, the squatter ideal. To the pioneer, government was an evil. The other was the ideal of a democracy, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. The operation of these ideals took place contemporaneously with the passing into private possession of the free public domain and the natural resources of the United States. But American democracy was based on an abundance of free lands. These were the very conditions that shaped its growth and its fundamental traits. Thus, time has revealed that these two ideals of pioneer democracy had elements of mutual hostility and contained the seeds of its dissolution. The present finds itself engaged in the task of readjusting its old ideals to new conditions and is turning increasingly to government to preserve its traditional democracy. It is not surprising that socialism shows noteworthy gains as elections continue, that parties are forming on new lines, that the demand for primary elections, for popular choice of senators, initiative, referendum, and recall is spreading, and that the regions once the center of pioneer democracy exhibit these tendencies in the most marked degree. They are efforts to find substitutes for that former safeguard of democracy, the disappearing free lands. They are the sequence to the extinction of the frontier. It is necessary next to notice that in the midst of all this national energy, and contemporaneous with the tendency to turn to the national government for protection to democracy, there is clear evidence of the persistence and the development of sectionalism. Whether we observe the grouping of votes in Congress and in the general elections, or the organization and utterances of business leaders, or the association of scholars, churches, or other representatives of the things of the spirit, we find that American life is not only increasing in its national intensity, but that it is integrating by sections. In part, this is due to the factor of great spaces which make sectional rather than national organization the line of least resistance. But in part, it is also the expression of the separate economic, political, and social interests and the separate spiritual life of the various geographic provinces or sections. The votes on the tariff, and in general, the location of the strongholds of the progressive Republican movement, illustrate this fact. 
the difficulty of a national adjustment of railway rates to the diverse interests of different sections is another example without attempting to enter upon a more extensive discussion of sectionalism i desire simply to point out that there are evidences that now as formerly the separate geographical interests have their leaders and spokesmen that much congressional legislation is determined by the contests triumphs or compromises between the rival sections and that the real federal relations of the united states are shaped by the interplay of sectional with national forces rather than by the relation of state and nation as time goes on and the nation adjusts itself more durably to the conditions of the differing geographic sections which make it up they are coming to a new self-consciousness and a revived self-assertion our national character is a composite of these sections obviously in attempting to indicate even a portion of the significant features of our recent history we have been obliged to take note of a complex of forces the times are so close at hand that the relations between events and tendencies force themselves upon our attention we have had to deal with the connections of geography industrial growth politics and government with these we must take into consideration the changing social composition the inherited beliefs and habitual attitude of the masses of the people the psychology of the nation and of the separate sections as well as of the leaders we must see how these leaders are shaped partly by their time and section and how they are in part original creative by virtue of their own genius and initiative we cannot neglect the moral tendencies and the ideals all are related parts of the same subject and can no more be properly understood in isolation than the movement as a whole can be understood by neglecting some of these important factors or by the use of a single method of investigation whatever be the truth regarding european history american history is chiefly concerned with social forces shaping and reshaping under the conditions of a nation changing as it adjusts to its environment and this environment progressively reveals new aspects of itself exerts new influences and calls out new social organs and functions i have undertaken this rapid survey of recent history for two purposes first because it has seemed fitting to emphasize the significance of american development since the passing of the frontier and second because in the observation of present conditions we may find assistance in our study of the past it is a familiar doctrine that each age studies its history anew and with interest determined by the spirit of the time each age finds it necessary to reconsider at least some portion of the past from points of view furnished by new conditions which reveal the influence and significance of forces not adequately known by the historians of the previous generation unquestionably each investigator and writer is influenced by the times in which he lives and while this fact exposes the historian to a bias at the same time it affords him new instruments and new insight for dealing with his subject if recent history then gives new meaning to past events if it has to deal with the rise into a commanding position of forces the origin and growth of which may have been inadequately described or even overlooked by historians of the previous generation it is important to study the present and the recent past not only for themselves but also as the source of new hypotheses new lines of inquiry new criteria of the perspective of the remoter past and moreover a just public opinion and a statesmanlike treatment of present problems demand that they be seen in their historical relations in order that history may hold the lamp for conservative reform seen from the vantage ground of present developments what new light falls upon past events when we consider what the mississippi valley has come to be in american life and when we consider what it is yet to be the young washington crossing the snows of the wilderness to summon the french to evacuate the portals of the great valley becomes the herald of an empire when we recall the huge industrial power that has centered at pittsburgh braddock's advance to the forks of the ohio takes on a new meaning even in defeat he opened a road to what is now the center of the world's industrial energy the modifications which england proposed in seventeen ninety four to john jay in the northwestern boundary of the united states from the lake of the woods to the mississippi seemed to him doubtless significant chiefly as a matter of principle and as a question of the retention or loss of beaver grounds the historians hardly noticed the proposals but they involved in fact the ownership of the richest and most extensive deposits of iron ore in america the all-important source of a fundamental industry of the united states 
the occasion for the rise of some of the most influential forces of our time. What continuity and meaning are furnished by the outcome in present times of the movements of minor political parties and reform agitations? To the historian they have often seemed to be mere curious side eddies, vexatious distractions to the course of his literary craft as it navigated the stream of historical tendency. And yet, by the revelation of the present, what seem to be side eddies have not seldom proven to be concealed entrances to the main current and the course which seemed the central one has led to blind channels and stagnant waters, important in their day, but cut off like oxbow lakes from the mighty river of historical progress by the mere permanent and compelling forces of the neglected currents. We may trace the contest between the capitalist and the democratic pioneer from the earliest colonial days. It is influential in colonial parties, it is seen in the vehement protests of Kentucky frontiersmen in petition after petition to the Congress of the Confederation against the nabobs and men of wealth who took out titles to the pioneers' farms while they themselves were too busy defending those farms from the Indians to perfect their claims. It is seen in the attitude of the Ohio Valley in its backwoods days before the rise of the Whig Party, as when in 1811 Henry Clay denounced the Bank of the United States as a corporation which throve on special privileges, quote, a special association of favored individuals taken from the mass of society and invested with exemptions and surrounded by immunities and privileges, end of quote. Benton voiced the same contest 20 years later when he denounced the bank as, quote, a company of private individuals, many of them foreigners, and the mass of them residing in a remote and narrow corner of the Union, unconnected by any sympathy with the fertile regions of the Great Valley in which the natural power of this Union, the power of numbers, will be found to reside long before the renewed term of the Second Charter would expire. End of quote. Quote, and where, he asked, would all this power and money center? In the great cities of the Northeast which have been for 40 years, and by that force of federal legislation, the lion's den of southern and western money, that den into which all the tracks point inward, from which the returning track of a solitary dollar has never yet been seen, end of quote. Declaring, in words that have a very modern sound, that the bank tended to multiply nabobs and paupers, and that a great moneyed power is favorable to great capitalists, for it is the principle of capital to favor capital, he appealed to the fact of the country's extent and its sectional divergences against the nationalizing of capital. Quote, what a condition for a confederacy of states! What grounds for alarm and terrible apprehension when, in a confederacy of such vast extent, so many rival commercial cities, so much sectional jealousy, such violent political parties, such fierce contests for power, there should be but one moneyed tribunal before which all the rival and contending elements must appear. End of quote. Even more vehement were the words of Jackson in 1837. It is now plain, he wrote, that the war is to be carried on by the moneyed aristocracy of the few against the democracy of numbers, the prosperous to make the honest laborers hewers of wood and drawers of water through the credit and paper system. Van Buren's administration is usually passed hastily over with hardly more than mention of his independent treasury plan and with particular consideration of the slavery discussion, but some of the most important movements in American social and political history began in these years of Jackson and Van Buren. Read the demands of the obscure labor papers and the reports of labor's open-air meetings anew, and you will find in the utterances of so-called labor visionaries and the loco foco champions of equal rights for all and special privileges for none, like Evans and Jacques, Birdsall and Leggett, the finger points to the currents that now make the main channel of our history. You will find in them some of the important planks of the platforms of the triumphant parties of our own day. As Professor Commons has shown by his papers and the documents which he has published on labor history, an idealistic but widespread and influential humanitarian movement, strikingly similar to that of the present, arose in the years between 1830 and 1850, dealing with social forces in American life, animated by a desire to apply the public lands to social amelioration, eager to find new forms of democratic development. But the flood of the slavery struggle swept all of these movements into its mighty inundation for the time. After the war, other influences delayed the revival of the movement. 
The railroads opened the wide prairies after 1850 and made it easy to reach them, and decade after decade new sections were reduced to the purposes of civilization and to the advantages of the common man as well as the promotion of great individual fortunes. The nation centered its interests in the development of the West. It is only in our own day that this humanitarian democratic wave has reached the level of those earlier years. But in the meantime, there are clear evidences of the persistence of the forces, even though under strange guise. Read the platforms of the Greenback Labor, the Granger, and the Populist Parties, and you will find in those platforms, discredited and reprobated by the major parties of the time, the basic proposals of the Democratic Party after its revolution under the leadership of Mr. Bryan, and of the Republican Party after its revolution by Mr. Roosevelt. The insurgent movement is so clearly related to the areas and elements that gave strength to this progressive assertion of old democratic ideals with new weapons that it must be regarded as the organized refusal of these persistent tendencies to be checked by the advocates of more moderate measures. End of section 39. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 40 of The Frontier in American History by Frederick Jackson Turner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 12, Social Forces in American History, Part 3. I have dealt with these fragments of party history, not, of course, with the purpose of expressing any present judgment upon them, but to emphasize and give concreteness to the fact that there is disclosed by present events a new significance to these contests of radical democracy and conservative interests, that they are rather a continuing expression of deep-seated forces than fragmentary and sporadic curios for the historical museum. If we should survey the history of our lands from a similar point of view, considering the relations of legislation and administration of the public domain to the structure of American democracy, it would yield a return far beyond that offered by the formal treatment of the subject in most of our histories. We should find in the squatter doctrines and practices, the seizure of the best soils, the taking of public timber on the theory of a right to it by the labor expended on it, fruitful material for understanding the atmosphere and ideals under which the great corporations developed the West. Men like Senator Benton and Delegate Sibley in successive generations defended the trespasses of the pioneer and the lumberman upon the public forest lands, and denounced the paternal government that harassed these men who were engaged in what we should call stealing government timber. It is evident that at some time between the middle of the 19th century and the present time, when we impose jail sentences upon congressmen caught in such violations of the land laws, a change came over the American conscience and the civic ideals were modified. That our great industrial enterprises developed in the midst of these changing ideals is important to recall when we write the history of their activity. We should find also that we cannot understand the land question without seeing its relations to the struggle of sections and classes bidding against each other and finding in the public domain a most important topic of political bargaining. We should find, too, that the settlement of unlike geographic areas in the course of the nation's progress resulted in changes in the effect of the land laws, that a system intended for the humid prairies was ill-adjusted to the grazing lands and coal fields and to the forests in the days of large-scale exploitation by corporations commanding great capital. Thus, changing geographic factors, as well as the changing character of the forces which occupied the public domain, must be considered, if we would understand the bearing of legislation and policy in this field. It is fortunate that suggestive studies of democracy and the land policy have already begun to appear. The whole subject of American agriculture, viewed in relation to the economic, political, and social life of the nation, has important contributions to make. If, for example, we study the maps showing the transition of the wheat belt from the east to the west as the virgin soils were conquered and made new bases for destructive competition with the older wheat states, we shall see how deeply they affected not only land values, railroad building, the movement of population, and the supply of cheap food, but also how the regions once devoted to single cropping of wheat were forced to turn to varied and intensive agriculture and to diversified industry. And we shall see, also, how these transformations affected party politics and even the ideals of the Americans of the regions thus changed. 
we shall find in the overproduction of wheat in the provinces thus rapidly colonized and in the overproduction of silver in the mountain provinces which were contemporaneously exploited important explanations of the peculiar form which american politics took in the period when mr bryan mastered the democratic party just as we shall find in the opening of the new gold fields in the years immediately following and in the passing of the era of almost free virgin wheat soils explanations of the more recent period when high prices are giving new energy and aggressiveness to the demands of the new american industrial democracy enough has been said it may be assumed to make clear the point which i am trying to elucidate namely that a comprehension of the united states of today an understanding of the rise and progress of the forces which have made it what it is demands that we should rework our history from the new points of view afforded by the present if this is done it will be seen for example that the progress of the struggle between north and south over slavery and the freed negro which held the principal place in american interest in the two decades after eighteen fifty was after all only one of the interests in the time the pages of the congressional debates the contemporary newspapers the public documents of those twenty years remain a rich mine for those who will seek therein the sources of movements dominant in the present day the final consideration to which i ask your attention in this discussion of social forces in american life is with reference to the mode of investigating them and the bearing of these investigations upon the relations and the goal of history it has become a precedent fairly well established by the distinguished scholars who have held the office which i am about to lay down to state a position with reference to the relations of history and its sister studies and even to raise the question of the attitude of the historian toward the laws of thermodynamics and to seek to find the key of historical development or of historical degradation it is not given to all to bend the bow of ulysses i shall attempt a lesser task we may take some lessons from the scientist he has enriched knowledge especially in recent years by attacking the no man's lands left unexplored by the too sharp delimitation of spheres of activity these new conquests have been especially achieved by the combination of old sciences physical chemistry electrochemistry geophysics astrophysics and a variety of other scientific unions have led to audacious hypotheses veritable flashes of vision which open new regions of activity for a generation of investigators moreover they have promoted such investigations by furnishing new instruments of research now in some respects there is an analogy between geology and history the new geologist aims to describe the inorganic earth dynamically in terms of natural law using chemistry physics mathematics and even botany and zoology as far as they relate to paleontology but he does not insist that the relative importance of physical or chemical factors shall be determined before he applies the methods and data of these sciences to his problem indeed he has learned that a geological area is too complex a thing to be reduced to a single explanation he has abandoned the single hypothesis for the multiple hypothesis he creates a whole family of possible explanations of a given problem and thus avoids the warping influence of partiality for a simple theory have we not here an illustration of what is possible and necessary for the historian is it not well before attempting to decide whether history requires an economic interpretation or a psychological or any other ultimate interpretation to recognize that the factors in human society are varied and complex that the political historian handling his subject in isolation is certain to miss fundamental facts and relations in his treatment of a given age or nation that the economic historian is exposed to the same danger and so of all the other special historians those who insist that history is simply the effort to tell the thing exactly as it was to state the facts are confronted with the difficulty that the fact which they would represent is not planted on the solid ground of fixed conditions it is in the midst and is itself a part of the changing currents the complex and interacting influences of the time deriving its significance as a fact from its relations to the deeper seated movements of the age movements so gradual that often only the passing years can reveal the truth about the fact and its right to a place on the historian's page the economic historian is in danger of making his analysis and his statement of a law on the basis of present conditions and then passing to history for justificatory appendixes to his conclusions 
an American economist of high rank has recently expressed his conception of the full relation of economic theory, statistics, and history in these words, quote, A principle is formulated by a priori reasoning concerning facts of common experience. It is then tested by statistics and promoted to the rank of a known and acknowledged truth. Illustrations of its action are then found in narrative history, and on the other hand, the economic law becomes the interpreter of records that would otherwise be confusing and comparatively valueless. The law itself derives its final confirmation from the illustrations of its working which the records afford, but what is at least of equal importance is the parallel fact that the law affords the decisive test of the correctness of those assertions concerning the causes and the effects of past events which it is second nature to make, and which historians almost invariably do make in connection with their narrations. End of quote. There is much in this statement by which the historian may profit, but he may doubt also whether the past should serve merely as the illustration by which to confirm the law deduced from common experience by a priori reasoning tested by statistics. In fact, the pathway of history is strewn with the wrecks of the known and acknowledged truths of economic law, due not only to defective analysis and imperfect statistics, but also to the lack of critical historical methods, of insufficient historical mindedness on the part of the economist, to failure to give due attention to the relativity and transiency of the conditions from which his laws were deduced. But the point on which I would lay stress is this. The economist, the political scientist, the psychologist, the sociologist, the geographer, the student of literature, of art, of religion, all the allied laborers in the study of society have contributions to make to the equipment of the historian. These contributions are partly of material, partly of tools, partly of new points of view, new hypotheses, new suggestions of relations, causes, and emphasis. Each of these special students is in some danger of bias by his particular point of view, by his exposure to see simply the thing in which he is primarily interested, and also by his effort to deduce the universal laws of his separate science. The historian, on the other hand, is exposed to the danger of dealing with the complex and interacting social forces of a period or of a country from some single point of view to which his special training or interest inclines him. If the truth is to be made known, the historian must so far familiarize himself with the work and equip himself with the training of his sister subjects that he can at least avail himself of their results and in some reasonable degree master the essential tools of their trade and the followers of the sister studies must likewise familiarize themselves and their students with the work and the methods of the historians and cooperate in the difficult task. It is necessary that the American historian shall aim at this equipment not so much that he may possess the key to history or satisfy himself in regard to its ultimate laws. At present, a different duty is before him. He must see an American society with its vast spaces its sections equal to European nations, its geographic influences, its brief period of development, its variety of nationalities and races, its extraordinary industrial growth under the conditions of freedom, its institutions, cultures, ideals, social psychology, and even its religions forming and changing almost under his eyes, one of the richest fields ever offered for the preliminary recognition and study of the forces that operate and interplay in the making of society. End of section 40. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 41 of The Frontier in American History. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Frontier in American History by Frederick Jackson Turner. Chapter 13, Middle Western Pioneer Democracy, Part 1. In time of war, when all that this nation has stood for, all the things in which it passionately believes are at stake, we have met to dedicate this beautiful home for history. There is a fitness in the occasion. It is for historic ideals that we are fighting. If this nation is one for which we should pour out our savings, postpone our differences, go hungry, and even give up life itself, it is not because it is a rich, extensive, well-fed, and populous nation. It is because from its early days America has pressed onward toward a goal of its own, that it has followed an ideal, the ideal of a democracy developing under conditions unlike those of any other age or country. 
We are fighting not for an old world ideal, not for an abstraction, not for a philosophical revolution. Broad and generous as are our sympathies, widely scattered in origin as are our people, keenly as we feel the call of kinship, the thrill of sympathy with the stricken nations across the Atlantic, we are fighting for the historic ideals of the United States, for the continued existence of the type of society in which we believe, because we have proved it good for the things which drew European exiles to our shores, and which inspired the hopes of the pioneers. We are at war that the history of the United States, rich with the record of high human purposes and of faith in the destiny of the common man under freedom, filled with the promises of a better world, may not become the lost and tragic story of a futile dream. Yes, it is an American ideal and an American example for which we fight, but in that ideal and example lies medicine for the healing of the nations. It is the best we have to give to Europe, and it is a matter of vital import that we shall safeguard and preserve our power to serve the world, and not be overwhelmed in the flood of imperialistic force that wills the death of democracy and would send the freemen under the yoke. Essential as are our contributions of wealth, the work of our scientists, the toil of our farmers, and our workmen in factory and shipyard, priceless as is the stream of young American manhood which we pour forth to stop the flood which flows like molten lava across the green fields and peaceful hamlets of Europe toward the sea and turns to ashes and death all that it covers, these contributions have their deeper meaning in the American spirit. They are born of the love of democracy." Long ago in prophetic words, Walt Whitman voiced the meaning of our present sacrifices. Sail, sail thy best ship, ship of democracy. Of value is thy freight, tis not the present only, the past is also stored in thee. Thou holdest not the venture of thyself alone, not of the western continent alone. Earth's resume entire floats on thy keel, O ship, is steadied by thy spars. With thee time voyages in trust, the antecedent nations sink or swim with thee. With all their ancient struggles, martyrs, heroes, epics, wars, thou bearest the other continents. Theirs, theirs, as much as thine, the destination port triumphant. Shortly before the Civil War, a great German, exiled from his native land for his love of freedom, came from his new home among the pioneers of the Middle West to set forth in Faneuil Hill, the cradle of liberty in Boston, his vision of the young America that was forming in the West, the last depository of the hopes of all true friends of humanity. Speaking of the contrast between the migrations to the Mississippi Valley and those of the Old World in other centuries, he said, It is now not a barbarous multitude pouncing upon old and decrepit empires, not a violent concussion of tribes accompanied by all the horrors of general destruction, but we see the vigorous elements, peaceably congregating and mingling together on virgin soil, led together by the irresistible attraction of free and broad principles, undertaking to commence a new era in the history of the world, without first destroying the results of the progress of past periods, undertaking to found a cosmopolitan nation without marching over the dead bodies of slain millions. If Karl Schurz had lived to see the outcome of that Germany from which he was sent as an exile, in the days when Prussian bayonets dispersed the legislatures and stamped out the beginnings of democratic rule in his former country, could he have better pictured the contrast between the Prussian and the American spirit? He went on to say, Thus was founded the great colony of free humanity, which has not old England alone, but the world for its mother country. And in the colony of free humanity, whose mother country is the world, they establish the republic of equal rights, where the title of manhood is the title to citizenship. My friends, if I had a thousand tongues and a voice as strong as the thunder of heaven, they would not be sufficient to impress upon your minds forcibly enough the greatness of this idea, the overshadowing glory of this result. This was the dream of the truest friends of man from the beginning. For this the noblest blood of martyrs has been shed. For this has mankind waded through seas of blood and tears. There it is now. There it stands. The noble fabric in all the splendor of reality. It is in a solemn and inspiring time, therefore, that we meet to dedicate this building, and the occasion is fitting to the time. We may now see, as never before, the deeper significance, the larger meaning of these pioneers, whose plain lives and homely annals are glorified as a part of the story of the building of a better system of social justice under freedom, a broader and, as we fervently hope, a more enduring foundation for the welfare and progress under individual liberty of the common man, an example of federation, of peaceful adjustments by compromise and concession under a self-governing republic, where sections replaced nations over a union as large as Europe, 
where party discussions take place of warring countries, where the Pax Americana furnishes an example for a better world. As our forefathers, the pioneers, gathered in their neighborhood to raise the log cabin and sanctioned it by the name of home, the dwelling place of pioneer ideals, so we meet to celebrate the raising of this home, this shrine of Minnesota's historic life. It symbolizes the conviction that the past and the future of this people are tied together, that this historical society is the keeper of the records of a noteworthy movement in the progress of mankind, that these records are not unmeaning and antiquarian, but even in their details are worthy of preservation for their revelation of the beginnings of society in the midst of a nation caught by the vision of a better future for the world. Let me repeat the words of Harriet Martineau, who portrayed the American of the 30s. I regard the American people as a great embryo poet, now moody, now wild, but bringing out results of absolute good sense. Restless and wayward in action, but with deep peace at his heart, exulting that he has caught the true aspect of things past and the depth of futurity which lies before him, wherein to create something so magnificent as the world has scarcely begun to dream of. There is the strongest hope of a nation that is capable of being possessed with an idea." And recall her appeal to the American people to cherish their high democratic hope, their faith in man. The older they grow, the more they must reverence the dreams of their youth. The dreams of their youth. Here they shall be preserved, and the achievements as well as the aspirations of the men who made the state, the men who built on their foundations, the men with large vision and power of action, the lesser men in the mass, the leaders who serve the state and nation with devotion to the cause. Here shall be preserved the record of the men who failed to see the larger vision and worked impatiently with narrow or selfish or class ends, as well as of those who labored with patience and sympathy and mutual concession, with readiness to make adjustments and to subordinate their immediate interests to the larger good and the immediate safety of the nation. In the archives of such an old institution as that of the Historical Society of Massachusetts, whose treasures run to the beginning of the Puritan colonization, the students cannot fail to find the evidence that a state historical society is a book of judgment, wherein is made up the record of a people and its leaders. So, as time unfolds, shall be the collections of this society, the depository of the material that shall preserve the memory of this people. Each section of this widely extended and varied nation has its own peculiar past, its special form of society, its traits, and its leaders. It were a pity if any section left its annals solely to the collectors of a remote region, and it were a pity if its collections were not transformed into printed documents and monographic studies, which can go to the libraries of all the parts of the Union and thus enable the student to see the nation as a whole in its past as well as in its present. This society finds its special field of activity in a great state of the Middle West so new as history reckons time, that its annals are still predominantly those of the pioneers, but so rapidly growing that already the era of pioneers is a part of the history of the past, capable of being handled objectively, seen in a perspective that is not possible to the observer of the present conditions. Because of these facts, I have taken the special theme of this address, the Middle Western Pioneer Democracy, which I would sketch in some of its outstanding aspects, and chiefly in the generation before the Civil War, for it was from those pioneers that the later colonization to the newer parts of the Mississippi Valley derived much of their traits, and from whom large numbers of them came. The North Central States as a whole is a region comparable to all of Central Europe. Of these states, a large part of the Old Northwest, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin, and their sisters beyond the Mississippi, Missouri, Iowa, and Minnesota, were still in the middle of the 19th century the home of an essentially pioneer society. Within the lifetime of many living men, Wisconsin was called the Far West, and Minnesota was a land of the Indian and the fur traders, a wilderness of forest and prairie beyond the edge of cultivation. That portion of this great region which was still in the pioneering period of settlement by 1850 was alone about as extensive as the old 13 states, or Germany and Austria-Hungary combined. The region was a huge geographic mould for a new society, modelled by nature on the scale of the Great Lakes, the Ohio Valley, the Upper Mississippi and the Missouri. Simple and majestic in its vast outlines, it was graven into a variety that in its detail also had a largeness of design. From the Great Lakes extended the massive glacial sheet which covered that mighty basin and laid down treasures of soil. Vast forests of pine shrouded its upper zone, breaking into hardwood and the oak openings as they neared the ocean-like expanses of the prairies. Forests again along the Ohio Valley and beyond to the west lay the levels of the Great Plains. 
Within the earth were unexploited treasures of coal and lead, copper and iron in such form and quantity as were to revolutionize the industrial processes of the world. But nature's revelations are progressive, and it was rather the marvelous adaptation of the soil to the raising of corn and wheat that drew the pioneers to this land of promise and made a new era of colonization. In the unity with variety of this pioneer empire and in its broad levels we have a promise of its society. End of section 41. Section 42 of The Frontier in American History. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Frontier in American History by Frederick Jackson Turner. Chapter 13, Part 2. First had come the children of the interior of the South, and with axe and rifle in hand had cut their clearings in the forest, raised their log cabins, fought the Indians, and by 1830 had pushed their way to the very edge of the prairies along the Ohio and Missouri valleys, leaving unoccupied most of the basin of the Great Lakes. These slashes of the forest, these self-sufficing pioneers, raising the corn and livestock for their own need, living scattered and apart, had at first small interest in town life or a share in markets. They were passionately devoted to the ideal of equality, but it was an ideal which assumed that under free conditions in the midst of unlimited resources, the homogeneous society of the pioneers must result in equality. What they objected to was arbitrary obstacles, artificial limitations upon the freedom of each member of this frontier folk to work out his own career without fear or favour. What they instinctively opposed was the crystallization of differences, the monopolization of opportunity, and the fixing of that monopoly by government or by social customs. The road must be open. The game must be played according to the rules. There must be no artificial stifling of equality of opportunity, no closed doors to the able, no stopping the free game before it was played to the end. More than that, there was an unformulated, perhaps, but very real feeling that mere success in the game by which the abler men were able to achieve preeminence gave the successful ones no right to look down upon their neighbours, no vested title to assert superiority as a matter of pride, and to the diminution of the equal right and dignity of the less successful. If this democracy of southern pioneers, this Jacksonian democracy, was, as its socialist critics have called it, in reality a democracy of expectant capitalists, it was not one which expected or acknowledged on the part of the successful ones the right to harden their triumphs into the rule of a privileged class. In short, if it is indeed true that the backwoods democracy was based upon equality of opportunity, it is also true that it represented the conception that opportunity under competition should result in the hopeless inequality or rule of class. Ever a new clearing must be possible, and because the wilderness seemed so unending, the menace to the enjoyment of this ideal seemed rather to be feared from government, within or without, than from the operations of internal evolution. From the first, it became evident that these men had means of supplementing their individual activity by informal combinations. One of the things that impressed all early travelers in the United States was the capacity for extra-legal, voluntary association. This was natural enough. In all America we can study the process by which in a new land social customs form and crystallize into law. We can even see how the personal leader becomes the governmental official. This power of the newly arrived pioneers to join together for a common end without the intervention of governmental institutions was one of their marked characteristics. The log rolling, the house raising, the husking bee, the apple paring, and the squatters' associations whereby they protected themselves against the speculators in securing title to their clearings on the public domain, the camp meeting, the mining camp, the vigilantes, the cattle raisers' associations, the gentlemen's agreements, are a few of the indications of this attitude. It is well to emphasize this American trait, because in a modified way it has come to be one of the most characteristic and important features of the United States of today. America does, through informal association and understandings on the part of the people, many of the things which in the old world are and can be done only by governmental intervention and compulsion. These associations were in America not due to immemorial custom of tribe or village community, they were exemptorized by voluntary action. The actions of these associations had an authority akin to that of law. They were usually not so much evidences of a disrespect for law and order as the only means by which real law and order were possible in a region where settlement and society had gone in advance of the institutions and instrumentalities of organized society. 
Because of these elements of individualistic competition and the power of spontaneous association, pioneers were responsive to leadership. The backwoods men knew that under the free opportunities of his life, the abler man would reveal himself and show them the way. By free choice and not by compulsion, by spontaneous impulse and not by the domination of a caste, they rallied around a cause, they supported an issue. They yielded to the principle of government by agreement, and they hated the doctrine of autocracy even before it gained a name. They looked forward to the extension of their American principles to the Old World, and their keenest apprehensions came from the possibility of the extension of the Old World system of arbitrary rule, its class wars and rivalries and interventions to the destruction of the free states and democratic institutions which they were building in the forests of America. If we add to these aspects of early backwards democracy its spiritual qualities, we shall more easily understand them. These men were emotional. As they wrestled their clearing from the woods and from the savages who surrounded them, as they expanded that clearing and saw the beginnings of commonwealths, where only little communities had been, and as they saw these communities touch hands with each other along the great course of the Mississippi River, they became enthusiastically optimistic and confident of the continued expansion of this democracy. They had faith in themselves and their destiny and that optimistic faith was responsible both for their confidence in their own ability to rule and for the passion for expansion they looked to the future others appeal to history an american appeals to prophecy and with malthus in one hand and a map of the back country in the other he boldly defies us to a comparison with america as she is to be said a london periodical in eighteen twenty one just because perhaps of the usual isolation of their lives when they came together in associations whether of the camp meeting or of the political gathering they felt the influence of a common emotion and enthusiasm whether scotch irish presbyterian baptist or methodist these people saturated their region and their politics with feeling both the stump and the pulpit were centres of energy electric cells capable of starting wide spreading fires they felt both their religion and their democracy and were ready to fight for it this democracy was one that involved a real feeling of social comradeship among its widespread members justice catron who came from arkansas to the supreme court in the presidency of jackson said the people of new orleans and st louis are next neighbors if we desire to know a man in any quarter of the union we inquire of our next neighbor who but the other day lived by him exaggerated as this is it nevertheless had a surprising measure of truth for the middle west as well for the mississippi river was the great highway down which groups of pioneers like abraham lincoln on their rafts and flat boats brought the little neighborhood surplus after the steamboat came to the western waters the voyages up and down by merchants and by farmers shifting their homes brought people into contact with each other over wide areas this enlarged neighborhood democracy was determined not by a reluctant admission that under the law one man is as good as another it was based upon good fellowship sympathy and understanding they were of a stock moreover which sought new trails and were ready to follow where the trail led innovators in society as well as finders of new lands by eighteen thirty the southern inundation ebbed and a different tide flowed in from the northeast by way of the erie canal and steam navigation on the great lakes to occupy the zone unreached by southern settlement this new tide spread along the margins of the great lakes found the oak openings and small prairie islands of southern michigan and wisconsin followed the fertile forested ribbons along the river courses far into the prairie lands and by the end of the forties began to venture into the margin of the open prairie in eighteen thirty the middle west contained a little over a million and a half people in eighteen forty over three and a third millions in eighteen fifty nearly five and a half millions although in eighteen thirty the north atlantic states numbered between three and four times as many people as the middle west yet in those two decades the middle west made an actual gain of several hundred thousand more than did the old section counties in the newer states rose from a few hundred to ten or fifteen thousand people in the space of less than five years suddenly with astonishing rapidity and volume a new people was forming with varied elements ideals and institutions drawn from all over this nation and from europe they were confronted with the problem of adjusting different stocks, varied customs and habits to their new home. In comparison with the Ohio Valley, the peculiarity of the occupation of the northern zone of the Middle West lay in the fact that the native element was predominantly from the older settlements of the Middle West itself and from New York and New England. But it was from the central and western counties of New York and from the western and northern parts of New England, the rural regions of declining agricultural prosperity, that the bulk of this element came. 
Thus the influence of the Middle West stretched into the Northeast, and attracted a farming population already suffering from Western competition. The advantage of abundant, fertile, and cheap land, the richer agricultural returns, and especially the opportunities for youth to rise in all the trades and professions, gave strength to this competition. By it, New England was profoundly and permanently modified. This Yankee stock carried with it a habit of community life, in contrast with the individualistic democracy of the southern element. The colonizing land companies, the town, the school, the church, the feeling of local unity, furnished the evidences of this instinct for communities. This instinct was accompanied by the creation of cities, the production of a surplus for market, the reaching out to connections with the trading centers of the East, the evolution of a more complex and at the same time a more integrated industrial society than that of the Southern pioneer. But they did not carry with them the unmodified New England institutions and traits. They came at a time and from a people less satisfied with the old order than were their neighbors in the East. They were the young men with initiative, with discontent, the New York element especially was affected by the radicalism of locofoco democracy which was in itself a protest against the established order. The winds of the prairie swept away almost at once a mass of old habits and prepossessions. Said one of these pioneers in a letter to friends in the East, If you value ease more than money or prosperity, don't come. Hands are too few for the work, houses for the inhabitants, and days for the day's work to be done. Next, if you can't stand seeing your old New England ideas, ways of doing and living, and in fact all of the good old Yankee fashions knocked out of shape and altered, or thrown by as unsuited to the climate, don't be caught out here. But if you can bear grief with a smile, can put up with a scale of accommodations ranging from the soft side of a plank before the fire, and perhaps three in a bed at that, down through the middling and inferior grades, if you are never at a loss for ways to do the most unpractical things without tools, if you can do all this and some more, come on. It is a universal rule here to help one another, each one keeping an eye single to his own business. They knew that they were leaving many dear associations of the old home, giving up many of the comforts of life, sacrificing things which those who remained thought too vital to civilization to be left but they were not mere materialists ready to surrender all that life is worth for immediate gain. They were idealists themselves, sacrificing the ease of the immediate future for the welfare of their children, and convinced of the possibility of helping to bring about a better social order and a freer life. They were social idealists, but they based their ideals on trust in the common man and the readiness to make adjustments, not on the rule of a benevolent despot or a controlling class. End of section 42 Section 43 of The Frontier in American History by Frederick Jackson Turner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 13, Middle Western Pioneer Democracy, Part 3. The attraction of this new home reached also into the Old World and gave a new hope and new impulses to the people of Germany, of England, of Ireland, and of Scandinavia. Both economic influences and revolutionary discontent promoted German migration at this time. Economic causes brought the larger volume, but the quest for liberty brought the leaders, many of whom were German political exiles. While the latter urged, with varying degrees of emphasis, that their own contribution should be preserved in their new surroundings, and a few visionaries even talked of a German state in the federal system, what was noteworthy was the adjustment of the emigrants of the 30s and 40s to Middle Western conditions. The response to the opportunity to create a new type of society in which all gave and all received and no element remained isolated. Society was plastic. In the midst of more or less antagonism between bowie knife Southerners, cow-milking Yankee Puritans, beer-drinking Germans, wild Irishmen, a process of mutual education, a giving and taking was at work. In the outcome, in spite of slowness of assimilation where different groups were compact and isolated from the others, and a certain persistence of inherited morale, there was the creation of a new type, which was neither the sum of all its elements, nor a complete fusion in a melting pot. They were American pioneers, not outlying fragments of New England, of Germany, or of Norway. The Germans were our most strongly represented in the Missouri Valley, in St. Louis, in Illinois opposite that city, and in the lakeshore counties of eastern Wisconsin north from Milwaukee. In Cincinnati and Cleveland there were many Germans, while in nearly half the counties of Ohio the German immigrants and the Pennsylvania Germans 
held nearly or quite the balance of political power. The Irish came primarily as workers on turnpikes, canals, and railroads, and tended to remain along such lines or to gather in the growing cities. The Scandinavians, of whom the largest proportion were Norwegians, founded their colonies in northern Illinois and in southern Wisconsin about the Fox and the headwaters of Rock River, whence in later years they spread into Iowa, Minnesota, and North Dakota. By 1850, about one-sixth of the people of the Middle West were of North Atlantic birth, about one-eighth of Southern birth, and a like fraction of foreign birth, of whom the Germans were twice as numerous as the Irish, and the Scandinavians only slightly more numerous than the Welsh, and fewer than the Scotch. There were only a dozen Scandinavians in Minnesota. The natives of the British islands, together with the natives of British North America in the Middle West, numbered nearly as many as the natives of German lands. But in 1850, almost three-fifths of the population were natives of the Middle West itself, and over a third of the population lived in Ohio. The cities were especially a mixture of peoples. In the five larger cities of the section, natives and foreigners were nearly balanced. In Chicago, the Irish, Germans, and natives of the North Atlantic states about equaled each other. But in all the other cities, the Germans exceeded the Irish in varying proportions. They were nearly three to one in Milwaukee. It is not merely that the section was growing rapidly and was made up of various stocks with many different cultures, sectional and European. What is more significant is that these elements did not remain as separate strata underneath an established ruling order, as was the case particularly in New England. All were accepted and intermingling components of a forming society, plastic and absorptive. The characteristic of the section as a good mixer became fixed before the large immigrations of the 80s. The foundations of the section were laid firmly in a period when the foreign elements were particularly free and eager to contribute to a new society and to receive an impress from the country which offered them a liberty denied abroad. Significant as is this fact and influential in the solution of America's present problems, it is no more important than the fact that in the decade before the Civil War, the southern element in the Middle West had also had nearly two generations of direct association with the northern and had finally been engulfed in a tide of northeastern and old-world settlers. In this society of pioneers, men learned to drop their old national animosities. One of the immigrant guides of the 50s urged the newcomers to abandon their racial animosities. The American laughs at these steerage quarrels, said the author. Thus, the Middle West was teaching the lesson of national cross-fertilization instead of national enmities, the possibility of a newer and richer civilization, not by preserving unmodified or isolated the old component elements, but by breaking down the line fences, by merging the individual life in the common product, a new product which held the promise of world brotherhood. If the pioneers divided their allegiance between various parties, Whig, Democrat, Free Soil, or Republican, it does not follow that the Western Whig was like the Eastern Whig. There was an infiltration of a Western quality into all of these. The Western Whigs supported Harrison more because he was a pioneer than because he was a Whig. It saw in him a legitimate successor of Andrew Jackson. The campaign of 1840 was a Middle Western camp meeting on a huge scale. The log cabins, the cider, and the coonskins were the symbols of the triumph of Middle Western ideas and were carried with misgivings by the merchants, the bankers, and the manufacturers of the East. In like fashion, the Middle Western wing of the Democratic Party was as different from the Southern wing, wherein lay its strength, as Douglas was from Calhoun. It had little in common with the slaveholding classes of the South, even while it felt the kinship of the pioneer with the people of the Southern upland stock from which so many Westerners were descended. In the later 40s and early 50s, most of the Middle Western states made constitutions. The debates in their conventions and the results embodied in the constitutions themselves tell the story of their political ideals. Of course, they based the franchise on the principle of manhood suffrage, but they also provided for an elective judiciary, for restrictions on the borrowing power of the state, lest it fall under the control of what they feared as the money power, and several of them either provided for the extinguishment of banks of issue or rigidly restrained them. Some of them exempted the homestead from forced sale for debt, Married women's legal rights were prominent topics in the debates at the conventions, and Wisconsin led off by permitting the alien to vote after a year's residence. It welcomed the newcomer to freedom and to the obligations of American citizenship. 
Although this pioneer society was preponderantly an agricultural society, it was rapidly learning that agriculture alone was not sufficient for its life. It was developing manufactures, trade, mining, the professions, and becoming conscious that in a progressive modern state it was possible to pass from one industry to another, and that all were bound by common ties. But it is significant that in the census of 1850, Ohio, out of a population of two millions, reported only a thousand servants, Iowa only ten in two hundred thousand, and Minnesota fifteen in its six thousand. In the intellectual life of this new democracy, there was already the promise of original contributions even in the midst of the engrossing toil and hard life of the pioneer. The country editor was a leader of his people, not a patent insides recorder of social functions, but a vigorous and independent thinker and writer. The subscribers to the newspaper published in the section were higher in proportion to population than in the state of New York, and not greatly inferior to those of New England, although such eastern papers as the New York Tribune had an extensive circulation throughout the Middle West. The agricultural press presupposed in its articles and contributions a level of general intelligence and interest above that of the later farmers of the section, at least before the present day. Farmer boys walked behind the plow with their book in hand and sometimes forgot to turn at the end of the furrow. Even rare boys who, like the young Howells, limped barefoot by his father's side with his eyes on the cow and his mind on Cervantes and Shakespeare. Periodicals flourished and faded like the prairie flowers. Some of Emerson's best poems first appeared in one of these Ohio Valley magazines. But for the most part, the literature of the region and the period was imitative or reflective of the common things in a not uncommon way. It is to its children that the Middle West had to look for the expression of its life and its ideals, rather than to the busy pioneer who was breaking a prairie farm or building up a new community. Illiteracy was least among the Yankee pioneers and highest among the Southern element. When illiteracy is mapped for 1850 by percentages, there appears two distinct zones, the one extending from New England, the other from the South. The influence of New England men was strong in the Yankee regions of the Middle West. Home missionaries and representatives of societies for the promotion of education in the West, both in the common school and denominational colleges, scattered themselves throughout the region and left a deep impress in all these states. The conception was firmly fixed in the 30s and 40s that the West was the coming power in the Union, that the fate of civilization was in its hands, and therefore rival sects and rival sections strove to influence it to their own types. But the Middle West shaped all these educational contributions according to her own needs and ideals. The state universities were, for the most part, the result of agitation and proposals of men of New England origin but they became characteristic products of Middle Western society, where the community as a whole, rather than wealthy benefactors, supported these institutions. In the end, the community determined their directions in accord with popular ideals. They reached down more deeply into the ranks of the common people than did the New England or Middle State colleges. They laid more emphasis upon the obviously useful and became coeducational at an early date. This dominance of the community ideals had dangers for the universities, which were called to raise ideals and to point new ways rather than to conform. Challenging the spaces of the West, struck by the rapidity with which a new society was unfolding under their gaze, it is not strange that the pioneers dealt in the superlative and saw their destiny with optimistic eyes. The meadow lot of the small intervale had become the prairie, stretching farther than their gaze could reach. All was motion and change. A restlessness was universal. Men moved in their single life from Vermont to New York, from New York to Ohio, from Ohio to Wisconsin, from Wisconsin to California, and longed for the Hawaiian Islands. When the bark started from their fence rails, they felt the call to change. They were conscious of the mobility of their society and gloried in it. They broke with the past and thought to create something finer, more fitting for humanity, more beneficial for the average man than the world had ever seen. Quote, with the past, we have literally nothing to do, said B. Gratz Brown in a Missouri Fourth of July oration in 1850, save to dream of it. Its lessons are lost and its tongue is silent. We are ourselves at the head and front of all political experience. Precedents have lost their virtue and all their authority is gone. Experience can profit us only to guard from antiquated delusions. End of quote. 
Quote, the yoke of opinion, wrote Channing to a Western friend speaking of New England, is a heavy one, often crushing individuality of judgment and action. End of quote. And he added that the habits, rules, and criticisms under which he had grown up had not left him the freedom and courage which are needed in the style of address best suited to the Western people. Channing no doubt unduly stressed the freedom of the West in this respect. The frontier had its own conventions and prejudices, and New England was breaking its own cake of custom and proclaiming a new liberty at the very time he wrote. But there was truth in the Eastern thought of the West as a land of intellectual toleration, one which questioned the old order of things and made innovation its very creed. The West laid emphasis upon the practical and demanded that ideals should be put to work for useful ends. Ideals were tested by their direct contributions to the betterment of the average man rather than by the production of the man of exceptional genius and distinction. For, in fine, this was the goal of the Middle West, the welfare of the average man, not only the man of the South or of the East, the Yankee or the Irishman or the German, but all men in one common fellowship. This was the hope of their youth, of that youth when Abraham Lincoln rose from rail splitter to country lawyer, from Illinois legislator to congressman and from congressman to president. It is not strange that in all this flux and freedom and novelty and vast spaces, the pioneer did not sufficiently consider the need of disciplined devotion to the government which he himself created and operated. But the name of Lincoln and the response of the pioneer to the duties of the Civil War, to the sacrifices and the restraints on freedom which it entailed under his presidency, reminds us that they knew how to take part in a common cause, even while they knew that war's conditions were destructive of many of the things for which they worked. There are two kinds of governmental discipline, that which proceeds from free choice, in the conviction that restraint of individual or class interests is necessary for the common good, and that which is imposed by a dominant class upon a subjected and helpless people. The latter is Prussian discipline, the discipline of a harsh, machine-like, logical organization based on the rule of a military autocracy. It assumes that if you do not crush your opponent first, he will crush you. It is the discipline of a nation ruled by its general staff, assuming war as the normal condition of peoples, and attempting with remorseless logic to extend its operations to the destruction of freedom everywhere. It can only be met by the discipline of a people who use their own government for worthy ends, who preserve individuality and mobility in society and respect the rights of others, who follow the dictates of humanity and fair play, the principles of give and take, the Prussian discipline is the discipline of Thor, the war god, against the discipline of the white Christ. Pioneer democracy has had to learn lessons by experience, the lesson that government on principles of free democracy can accomplish many things which the men of the middle of the 19th century did not realize were even possible. They have had to sacrifice something of their passion for individual unrestraint. They have had to learn that the specially trained man, the man fitted for his calling by education and experience, whether in the field of science or of industry, has a place in government, that the rule of the people is effective and enduring only as it incorporates the trained specialist into the organization of that government, whether as umpire between contending interests or as the efficient instrument in the hands of democracy. Organized democracy after the era of free land has learned that popular government to be successful must not only be legitimately the choice of the whole people, that the offices of that government must not only be open to all, but that in the fierce struggle of nations in the field of economic competition and in the field of war, the salvation and perpetuity of the republic depend upon recognition of the fact that specialization of the organs of the government, the choice of the fit and the capable for office, is quite as important as the extension of popular control. When we lost our free lands and our isolation from the old world, we lost our immunity from the results of mistakes, of waste, of inefficiency, and of inexperience in our government. But in the present day, we are also learning another lesson, which was better known to the pioneers than to their immediate successors. We are learning that the distinction arising from devotion to the interests of the commonwealth is a higher distinction than mere success in economic competition. America is now awarding laurels to the men who sacrifice their triumphs in the rivalry of business, in order to give their service to the cause of a liberty-loving nation, their wealth and their genius to the success of her ideals. 
That craving for distinction which once drew men to pile up wealth and exhibit power over the industrial processes of the nation is now finding a new outlet in the craving for distinction that comes from service to the Union in satisfaction in the use of great talent for the good of the Republic. And all over the nation, in voluntary organizations for aid to the government, is being shown the pioneer principle of association that was expressed in the house raising. It is shown in the Red Cross, the YMCA, the Knights of Columbus, the councils and boards of science, commerce, labor, agriculture, and in all the countless other types, from the association of women in their kitchen who carry out the recommendations of the food director and revive the plain living of the pioneer, to the Boy Scouts who are laying the foundations for a self-disciplined and virile generation worthy to follow the trail of the backwoodsmen. It is an inspiring prophecy of the revival of the old pioneer conception of the obligations and opportunities of neighborliness, broadening to a national and even to an international scope. The promise of what that wise and lamented philosopher Josiah Royce called the beloved community, in the spirit of the pioneer's house raising, lies the salvation of the Republic. This, then, is the heritage of pioneer experience, a passionate belief that a democracy was possible which should leave the individual a part to play in free society, and not make him a cog in a machine operated from above, which trusted in the common man, in his tolerance, his ability to adjust differences with good humor, and to work out an American type from the contributions of all nations, a type for which he would fight against those who challenged it in arms, and for which, in time of war, he would make sacrifices, even the temporary sacrifice of individual freedom and his life, lest that freedom be lost forever. End of section 43. Recording by Colleen McMahon. End of The Frontier in American History by Frederick Jackson Turner.